Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone around the world. Welcome to the Metaverse Nomads podcast, where we talk about our favorite Metaverse games. Joining me today are my fellow nomads. Jesse, how are you doing today? I am well, man. Excited to be here. We got a great show and just the whole industry, uh, you know, uh, being GameFi and Metaverse, uh, navigating these crypto storms without too much of tattered sales. It's all exciting. Tattered sales. There's a lot of tattered hearts in the in in the crypto community right now. Um, and Bonafide, how you doing today? Good morning, everybody. Across the metaverse, I'm doing well. And uh, similar to what Jesse's saying, no matter what's going on in the short term, if you're here now, we're all going to make it. Very good, Ray. How you doing today, man? You're muted, Besides being you're muted, on mute or silent. I'm doing great, guys. It's <laughs> there great you go. to be here with our special guest. <laughs> and uh, it's very early, so just have patience. Very well. Fancy, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Happy to have Chipto here with us. Very good, very good. And I'm Banjo Samurai, and collectively we are the Metaverse Nomads, and we lead a gaming guild called Rome. Uh, you can find out how to find us in the description. Uh, but most importantly, joining us today is a very special guest, Star Atlas, Star Atlas games designer Chipto. Uh, Chipto is a key system designer for Star Atlas, and he has his fingers in a little bit of everything over there. Chipto, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, guys. I'm excited to be here. I remember a few weeks, maybe several shows ago, I popped in unannounced, and you guys were like, who is this guy? Is he even like <laughs> part of the team? And then here I am finally on the show. So yeah, it's, been, it's come full circle. Love, love to be here and excited to answer all the questions. Well, thanks. And, you know, um, we, we had a little bit of, or I did, I should say, had a, a miscommunication. I thought you were somebody else working for uh, Star Atlas. And I've, I've gone under this impression for about a month now, but glad that you clarified that for us. Uh, I guess that goes to show that there's a number of community members that are being drawn into the Star Atlas team, which is fantastic because you already have a passion for what's there, right? Yeah, we've been hiring aggressively. And to be clear, anyone else thinking this? Xcode and I are, are different people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not hosting two accounts. So <laughs> that's funny. Well, I'm sure there's a number of people out there host, hosting two accounts. As they say, the game is already being played. Yeah. Um, so, Chipto, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you came to join the Star Atlas team. Sure. So, um, as mentioned, I'm uh, one of the one of the game system designers on Star Atlas. And I joined in October of uh, last year. Be before I kind of transitioned towards uh, game system design and, and crypto, I was a, a astronautical engineer. Um, I worked for um, the, the military. I was in the Air Force and I, and I have a space background. So I, I was with the military, with the Air Force, I was building um, satellites and satellite ground systems. I, I served for five years as an officer, and then I got out and uh, joined the civilian sector where I continued to build um, military uh, satellite systems. Um, I did that for about two years. And what happened was about two years in, I kept, and and obviously quarantine, everything was happening. I was reevaluating, well, well, what exactly do I, do I love doing? And I, I love space, but I woke up every day and I was excited about crypto. Like I've been in, I've been in crypto, the community since 2016 been an investor and I've been in crypto Twitter. I'm like following all the news and I, I get excited about that. I was getting excited about that every day. So I'm like, I, I kind of made a, a mental choice to, to kind of give it a shot. And I, I told the company I was working for, Hey, I, I'm going to, I'd like to go and, and pursue this. And, um, and they said, yeah, like we're all for that. If you ever want to come back, we'll, we'll, we'll welcome you back on the team. So it was like, it, it was kind of, that that risk was kind of mitigated a little bit I'm like okay if this doesn't work out i can go back and continue to build satellites but i i gave myself a couple months was searching for a crypto job i was originally looking at like more traditional crypto finance positions with um like with like cfi and things like that and but then i started digging into the the whole gaming and, and metaverse thing i was like this is super cool and i'm a, i'm an avid gamer and i found Star Atlas, and i, I reached out because they're a space game, like, hey guys, I have a space background. I love crypto, love games. Like, can I help? And um, talk to the right people. I ended up talking to Kelsey, and we we vibed, and and he's like, yeah, we, someone like you with that with that passion, we'd love to bring you on the team. And then I talked to Danny and Jacob, 
and um, we we kind of saw eye to eye on the on the grand vision, and then they hired me. And since October, it's been it's been a whirlwind. It's been super fun, and I don't dread Mondays anymore. You know, like it's like, it's amazing. So, so yeah, that's kind of my background on how I got to where I am now. That's awesome. I have a question with regards to your your past life in aerospace. Sure. Has there been anything along that road ever that has steered you in one way or another as to whether you believe there is life out there? <laughs> oh, you asked me if uh, in the military. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> give us the real. Give us the real alpha. My personal philosophical view is like the the space is so expansive, and there's it's like so many possibilities out there. I think mathematically, like, how can you not think that there's something else out there? Um, yeah, like that. <laughs> that has to exist somewhere. Right. And In some shape or form. And just because we can't observe it, like light tra- have a light has a, a travel speed doesn't mean we just it hasn't the light hasn't visited us yet. Or maybe there's some sort of like only technology that's prevent cloaking cloaking them. Who knows? But but yeah, I, I, I'm a believer and there's other things out there. Um, yeah. I don't know about you. What about you guys? Yeah. Yeah. I'm a firm believer. I agree. <laughs> yeah. The probability yeah. of something not is just, it just doesn't make sense. Yeah. I'll yeah, believe it when I see it. I, I'll go as far to, I'll go as far to say I, I'm not entirely sure that we haven't been visited or not, not entirely sure we haven't been visited yet. I think the possibility is there. I want it to be there. I want that thing to show up in the sky. I'm kind of with you on it, Banjo. I think the, uh, the 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 chances of something not have visited us already, and the chances of nothing being out there are very slim, right? The truth is out there. <laughs> we, we, that was the media programming us at a young age, Jesse. The truth right? is out there, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, uh, Chipta, what now that you've got this this uh, space background that's real world, it's scientific, and it has a lot of. Um, real world application and math and things like that. What, what future game mechanics do you see being um, either adjusted or influenced by your experience? So like one of the things that I brought up when I was talking to Danny in my interview is like, is there's a lot of, there's a lot of interesting things we can put in the game that is based on, on real science and and physics. And one of the, one of the ideas I, I, um, I propose is this concept of Lagrange points. I don't know how familiar you guys are with it, but the the recent launch of the the James Webb Telescope was sent to the Earth Moon, not Earth Moon, Earth Sun L2 point. And what a Lagrange point is is it's a is a position in space where gravi- gravity is at an equilibrium. So if you think of you know gravity as like this vector force field, it, everything balances out at these particular points in space and satellites and other celestial bodies can just rest there. They don't have to continue to spend a lot of fuel to stay in that one spot. So wouldn't it make sense that in our game, we use these, this concept of Lagrange points to host certain space stations as like refueling spots and the space station kind of hovers there and it doesn't have to spend a lot of fuel to, to maintain that spot. So, and maybe that's a very lucrative kind of parking spot that somebody can rent out right. or yeah, so. Yeah. I, yeah. yeah. So I, I thought that was neat, but then here's another idea. Well, what, and this actually happens in real space. Asteroids tend to accumulate at these spots because they, they kind of drift and then they get stuck, they get held in these yeah. equilibrium points. So what if, what if the savvy space adventurer, is going around like I I want to go to the Lagrange points, and they get there and there's like a lot of asteroids sitting there, a lot of a lot of loot, and there's a reason why based in real physics. Hmm. That sounds great. I, I think like it's super cool that Starless hired you. <laughs> I think so it's they, super cool that Starless hired you. That's a super cool idea. So you could use some real world physics to gain some clues as to where you might find resources. That's pretty. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, yeah. like if we're gonna hide things on the map. Let's let's put them in put them in spots that that uh, that actually make sense. Right. And then the person who who kind of figures that out has an advantage. So there's some alpha there. Um, yeah, just neat neat ideas like that. And then another idea, and this has already been um, expressed in a lot of games. It's like in crafting. Let's let's tie that in with some real material science. So if you're in, if you're 
get you're going up the hierarchy of microchips or like data or wiring and stuff well why don't you tie that towards actual material conductivity so if you start out with copper if you go to silver that's higher conductivity maybe gold maybe maybe graphene so mm -hmm. you kind of go up and up the hierarchy of, of conductivity and that gets you better and better electronics things like that is like bake that into the game um st with with still like an element of fantasy like there's going to be technologies in the game that we just can't like fathom right now but mm -hmm. there's also some things in the game that i'd like to bake in some realism so there's like a blend there and i think that'll be interesting uh balancing point to 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 work towards so i think every guild's going to be looking for their own uh astrophysicist now to know where they need to go <laughs> right right <laughs> the guiding light that'd be fair <laughs> so speaking speaking of guilds, let's just get it out on the table. You're not in a guild at this time, right, Shipto? No, um, I actually haven't. I, I wanted to join guilds, but um, when I joined the community, I it was very early on that I sent out that message to Star Atlas that I got hired. So I, I actually haven't been following Star Atlas much earlier than than maybe than October. So it was actually probably around August, September where I discovered them. So I, I'm not part of a of a guild. Um, but man, it'd be cool, and I like what it'll be interesting how we um, how we establish our our kind of company rules associated with that. I think that that's in the, it's in the process. But um, yeah, I'm not part of a guild. Um, but well, you already like have you, a uh, if, if you wanna if you wanna do well in the game, I feel like you should be. You already have a hashtag here, Chipto. So uh, watch out, but. <laughs> <laughs> so the I, and I think. Um, I think it's a good question and a good thing to talk about because I think there's going to be a lot of people. Well, we already established people who are passionate are going into the development team in mm -hmm. one capacity or another. Yeah. Um, and there's, as we've seen in other games, there is opportunities for uh, unethical behavior. So I think a lot of people are going to would love to have a developer on their in their guild, I'm sure. Um, but what a stressful situation for uh, somebody like you who goes into a guild and now you're you're on the hook. People are going to expect you to give them the inside scoop. Yeah, that's that's something we definitely want to avoid, and we don't want to give the impression that that our like the developers have an unfair advantage in the game, and then they're choosing guilds, and then guilds are are getting you know alpha or leaked content that will help them make more money. Like that, right. that's that's a lawsuit waiting to happen. So yeah. we're going to tread that very lightly, and we're and we already have our HR team thinking about the legal and HR thinking about this. So. Um, yeah, I've seen this. Yeah. I've seen this work out poorly in in different games in the past, and you know, thank God it wasn't you know real money involved at those times. So, I think it's good that you guys are actually taking that seriously and thinking about it. What do you think about the possibility of it being a thing where there's not necessarily a, a Star Atlas guild, like a like a developer guild, but more like you guys are spread out amongst all the guilds in a more equal, equi equitable fashion? I, I think that. I, if I had to like guess on on the the path we should take, I I think if we do want to the our like the developers, we want to play the game. I think we should be limited towards like playing single player and and maybe there's certain activities that we can't engage in. I'm not sure. I'm, I'm speculating here. Um, it'll it'll become more defined and like explicit as we get farther along in our development that this is what the developers can and can't do. And maybe maybe it's actually public our accounts and where we are and what we're doing that way people can monitor like i like your idea this though. guy is just like freighting his stuff back and forth just like an average guy you know <laughs> it, um, it'd be nice that um we, we're we're kind of trying to build on this foundation of transparency with our development we, we, mm -hmm. maybe we should be transparent with how we're playing the game as well um just my my, my own personal thoughts on that I like yeah, that makes sense. sense if you're creating this uh big game of course you're gonna want to be a part of it and, yeah, uh, rightfully so. Yeah, there's a lot of projects that are coming out that fall short in this area. And then a lot of the community gets upset very early on before there's even that growth curve. And, you yeah. know, so it's a shame. Yeah. Do you have any favorite ships uh, in particular? Yeah. So if we're, we're talking about um, like aesthetics, I really like Visas. Like, I, mm -hmm. I kind of like that stealth, pointy kind of. Yeah, just very dark militaristic vibe. I, so Visas is probably my favorite line, um, as far as as far as ships go. Do you do you own any ships currently? Yeah, no, I I, I own some ships, and I um, and 
I bought that at community prices, just like everybody else. Um, I play score. I, I keep my ships refueled. I, I've been buying some some more ships with with the Atlas earnings. I'm just enjoying the game as like as if I were a community member. So yeah, I'm engaging in the game. You know, that's a that's an interesting thing. It's kind of like I understand it's a touchy. Uh, it's it's kind of touchy about how you go about how do staff participate. But the truth is, I want everyone that's on the Star Atlas team to be able to have some way to enjoy it because that's it's your passion. It's what brought you there in the first place. So you should have the same opportunities to immerse yourself in the experience for sure. Yeah. Yeah, and and it, it's when we when we release score, just like kind of pulling that thread. The, it was all based on VWAPs. Every, everybody could calculate the VWAP. It's not like sh certain ships had a severe advantage versus others. So I think it, it wasn't quite that gray on on how to, the, the developers could play. We, we played just like everybody else. We bought ships that we liked and we were staking them. Um, mm. it'll, a, as the game mechanics become more complex, it, it'll become more gray. And we'll, we'll have to figure out how we tread that, that line. Mm -hmm. um, but for now, yeah, we, we, we love the ships too. We own we own some, and, and we're playing the game too. So before you you joined the dev team, did you have a profession that you wanted to play, and is it still the same? I I'm not a PvP guy. Um, okay. I'm like a PVE grind, like mm -hmm. build up my my own kind of solo ventures, and and I I, I like PVE more than PvP. So I, I like the idea of um, of like freighting and mining and and just the, the kind of the the more terrestrial infrastructure I, I really like doing that I, I don't see myself kind of engaging in in these pvp wars that are going to be in the high risk high risk zone i might like dip my toes in but i don't see myself being that that type of like <laughs> risk forward player just be out there as a spectator eating your popcorn <laughs> yeah yeah I, I, I'll, eat, I'll eat that up but i won't <laughs> well, yeah to, to to that end, and this is a question that I think a few of us have asked a different, a few different times. And if you don't have the answer, that's fine too. But will there be a way for people to go back and view those battles? So will there be an in-game recording of the battle um, so people can watch it? I haven't seen us fit, like map that particular thing out, but I think that would be, even if it's not us, there's going to be so many ways for community generated content to get part of our part of our like ecosystem i yeah. wouldn't be surprised if if there we some, some community member figures out a way to like record all of the map interactions and 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 these these battles or maybe there's an actual career in the game of like oh, right. journalism or space, yeah. <laughs> space journalism and record record yeah. and recount events and submit a a daily newsletter on this is what happened in this sector like that'd be fun we don't have to do that that that, that that'd be perfectly great content for the community to develop and I, we would love that so the the um you came into the company you you're, you've got this great experience behind you um, you're coming from a, a position of of expertise did you see anything when you got onto the team that you knew right away you had to be adjusted like oh that's not going to work uh, we we probably shouldn't go that route or did you kind of just jump in looking forward I don't, I don't think I, I found any like red flags or anything that hadn't been thought through thoroughly. Um, I've been working with Danny mostly at, uh, since he's the chief park officer. He's like the, the vision behind the game. And that guy is brilliant. Like he, he knows his stuff. So I, I kind of picked apart some of his like ideas and maybe and maybe like added more more detail or more color on some things. But there wasn't anything that kind of stood out as that that doesn't make any sense. Um, so yeah, yeah, it's and it's been interesting. I've been coming on. I, I came on the team originally to, to do ship crafting, and now I'm like, do I, I have my like you said earlier? I have my fingers in a lot of things, and I'm like, so I, I've been looking at like ship combat too, and and ship metrics. Like, how, how does a how do you load out a ship with components and modules and swap in and out, and what what will that look like? How will that feel? What's progression there? Um, so it's been really cool that that I started with one thing, but now I'm doing a lot of a lot of other things, and it's a pretty fun spot to be in because you get to see a lot of the you get to you get to you get to work on a lot of the cool stuff. Yeah, like so, like, go ahead, Bonafide. Well, well, just to 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 go off your last comment there, Chipto. So 
I know it's probably way too early to even be asking this question, but just out of curiosity, <laughs> is there any thought so far as to how the ships will be balanced, you know, PvP balance-wise? Yeah, so there's going to be... I mean, this is obvious. Like, ships are going to have quantitative metrics associated with the performance, and, you know... Um, there, there have to be a fine, there, there's going to have to be some balancing associated with big, like those large and expensive ships. It'd be really annoying if there's some sort of game mechanic where some XX small fighter can like attach to the hull and just click, just wipe you out. So there, right. there's going to be some balancing associated with that. And we're Absolutely. also, we're also like putting a lot of effort into what the ship combat, what is it, what is it going to look like? What can the blockchain support? There, like if you think about us wanting to do the game well no we, we are we're building the game on the blockchain you're not going to get 60 frame per second latency with current technology yeah. right maybe maybe you can you can say layer two can solve that well it's not it's not that easy right so if with that constraint what what is what is a what is meaningful combat is it turn-based is it is it are we gonna are we gonna just allow clunky latency and just kind of or slower interactions you're gonna have to charge up your weapon and then fire it like what there we're, we're thinking through a lot of these questions because we want there's going to be ship combat we're just trying to figure out what how, how to how to what build it, it like. so that it makes sense and it can be done on the blockchain and there's so but about ship balancing um yeah we're we're, we're gonna it's just gonna be we're gonna do some play testing and we're just going to we're we're gonna have to put a lot of thought into into like something that happens one versus every, like yeah, fleet interactions and just what makes sense what's fun um yeah yeah so it's a typical game like you know probably things will change quite a bit you know as the game launches and as we move forward and things of that nature yeah. thank you chip mm -hmm. You know, a consideration when it comes to thinking of physics, and I've seen some of this come up in conversation, I believe in foundation, about the different sizes of the alien species and, and their relationship to a ship that might be suited for them. Uh, there's the other considerations like the rainbow ships that are supposedly going to be a lot more efficient with their use of fuel and travel. You know, will that come into play or like the Calico Guardian that has hydroponics on board? Does that reduce their food consumption uh, for their missions? And can it actually become a profit center? I mean, like, there's lots of things like that that relate to ships that I I'm curious about. Yeah, that that's that's the intent. And depending on how you spec out your ship, you can maybe a ship like. A, a, like a fighter ship will have some intrinsic tendency towards having better combat stats, right? But that doesn't mean a player can't swap out some of the combat things, combat related things, and spec it out more for some sort of like exploration with with a little bit of a flavor of being able to defend themselves in combat. So there's going to be this this player driven kind of customization, um, and as you swap out components and modules for the right things you can your ship can get better at other aspects like like i mentioned exploration or freighting or yeah. bounty hunting um yeah because maybe a bounty hunter isn't you don't want to max out your firepower you probably want a little bit of stealth right right um and but there's a there's a give and take with everything so you, but that's the think... intent behind the modular customization of the ships with components and modules it's how you spec out and in, like make your ship better at one role versus another. Mm -hmm. And the pressure's on, right? Because if you have to rebalance after people have already invested their time and invested their money, um, now that money is involved, there's going to be people who are a little bit more upset maybe than the average person. Do you guys have those dialogues as far as if we have to rebalance X, it's going to, it's going to be a shit show. I mean, is that, <laughs> Yeah, no, that we, we're well aware of that concern, and and I think our our approach is these. It's kind of we we're we're forced in a position because we're we're already like public facing and we have real money involved that we have to have these incremental deliveries, mm -hmm. but it also affords us the ability to release gameplay with simpler mechanics, balance that, add 
add complexity, balance that. And it's not as much of a, much of a shock when we have to balance things because it's, it's not as, it's not like we released the entire complexity of the game fully polished and then we're having to change things. It's like we have, we can do these step functions and balance it as we go and it'll, it'll, um, it'll help address or mitigate that concern. Awesome. So you, you've, you mentioned briefly the lore. How much of the lore is there currently and how much are you writing as you go? You said Bunthius was, was writing it as he goes. Are, are you um, in a position where you can talk about maybe something within the lore that you're really excited about? Yeah, so the, the lore is, Danny's got the, the whole the context of the game like he has a timeline we know where we are in the timeline and we know where we're going we know we know about the different races we know about who like a bit about their identity and the factions um but there's there's it's still early there's like the whole skeleton of the roadmap and now we're like diving into the details and danny's been working a lot of that we, we've hired writers and other content like content developers to, to help kind of flesh that out. And there's some exciting things that we had planned, but, but yeah, I, I would say the lore is broadly defined and now we're, we're getting into the details. Awesome. And, and I, I kind of like the, like, I understand where our game and our gameplay is, is positioned within the lore. And it's kind of cool to kind of with, with the next deliveries, we're going to give more and more about where we are and what's going on. And, and we're going to tie it back to the lore and that that makes sites me i'm mean, it's like storytelling and it's really it's really cool so well maybe we should jump into that then so we're talking about cream is really what you're talking about right yeah and and for the people who may not be as in tune with cream you know a few sentences from your perspective of what cream is and what you hope to accomplish with it when it launches yeah so cream will enable supply chain logistics associated with mining, extracting resources from different celestial bodies, planets, asteroids, you, you have, whatever, uh, wherever, and then um, turning that into crafted uh, crafted assets. So your players will start to be able to make components, modules, even build, start building their own ships, which is exciting because then the whole economy become goes closed loop. So right now we kind of we we it's open loop. We inject the the ships and uh, players, you know, purchase those. But we what we really want is players to build the ships themselves and then sell them to other players, and it becomes this closed loop economy with a little bit of injection of Atlas to to kind of stimulate and and inflate a little bit so that new players can come in. Um, because we also we we want the game to like we want the game to be affordable to enter and play and engage with the players and and if like Atlas goes to thirty dollars, that kind of inhibits that process. So that, that there's a little bit of of injecting new capital to allow for more players to come into. Um, yeah, I'm yeah. Sure cream. I guess I went a little long on that, but cream is <laughs> is res resource extraction, craft, and crafting. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah, Fancy we, saw, we saw a bit of that uh, new cash being injected this week with the uh, Fimble Air Bike. Very cool new ship. And uh, looking forward to the next ones coming. Yeah, I really like the Fimble aesthetics. Um, it's It's got that like grungy mechanical look. Um, sure. I'm excited for, <laughs> for us to release more Fimbles. It's, it's going to be exciting. That thing is a rocket with a seat on it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I love like all something. the dials and screens on it. <laughs> Definitely yeah, mad scientist school. vibes. <laughs> Do the physics work out with this bike? <laughs> <laughs> How does that work? Uh, <laughs> but hey, it, it it's it's uh, bordering on the on the uh, on the uh, fantasy, but it works okay. out. I mean, the thrust is coming out one one side, and you're going in the in the other way, uh, the other direction. <laughs> Right, right. The thrust vector is aligned with the center of mass, so it, it makes sense. All right, cool. <laughs> so go. I've got another question for you, Chip. So, um, yeah, has Meta already won the war? <laughs> <laughs> written on the cargo container. That's hilarious. Is that post or pre-Meta? Facebook changing their <laughs> their uh, rebranding. Both. Right. That's great. Cool. So. 
So to that end, Chip, though, in that picture, we saw the cargo ship there. Mm-hmm. Um, do, uh, when we see these concept art pictures, can we anticipate that these are other ships that might show up, or are they just an artist's rendition? I'll honestly, I'll honestly, like I think some of the concept art is is artist rendition. It doesn't mm-hmm. necessarily imply that everything in the background is gameplay. Like, um, but there are some there are some Easter eggs in the, in, in the backgrounds of these things, and I, I'll leave that up to speculation interpretation. Mm. Everyone's going to be digging through Art Station today after <laughs> that comment, right? I think yeah. I think one of those one of those Easter eggs is that female was a former employee of uh, Facebook, and now she's just riding her thimble, unemployed as robots <laughs> took over. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Spot on. So, in, in relation to Cream Chip, though, you know, I, I think we've got a an abstract understanding of what it's going to be look what it's going to look like for resource generation. Are you able to give a little bit more clear picture? I mean, we stake, do we stake a ship and it generates so much iron or what is it going to look like and how are we going to extract the resources? If you can say. I mean, however a player gets access to a land plot, be it whether it's exploration or buys it from another player, they will have to stake a land claim on that mm-hmm. plot. Mm-hmm. And then they have access to the extracting the resources within that land plot right so and to continue to operate on that land you're going to be paying because you're in faction space you're going to you're going to be paying rent associated with with operating on that plot so there's going to be a a bit of a, a an upkeep cost but you'll be able to place down structures or construct structures on that plot that's a power plant right there mm-hmm. and that those structures will essentially allow you to extract resources almost like you're extracting atlas via ship staking it's, it's mm-hmm. going to be a similar concept where you'll be able to extract just physical ore from the planet and then that that ore will get turned into you know different metals and 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 different technologies that will help build out eventually these these ships so it it's pretty it's pretty simple but it'll be a very satisfying game loop game loop mm-hmm. and some of the complexity will be the, the peer-to-peer markets like mm-hmm. some players will be looking and see some dislocations in the market and like that thing's way overpriced or there's a lot of demand for that not enough supply i'll go fill that or maybe i hold on to my my certain resource because there's a lot of supply in the market now but if i wait and and put it list it when when some of the supply has been diminished then i can get a better price so there's gonna there's a, gonna be a lot of complexity just just in minute like operating within the marketplace. Um, so even if mining is simple, it's not necessarily simple getting the best bang for your buck on on selling and buying things. And well, I, I, got, I I don't know how many of you have played RuneScape and I played WoW too, where there's like, there's a whole gameplay loop that people just mm-hmm. dedicate a lot of their time to the marketplace. Yeah. Yeah, right? yeah. So this will be the first time that we really have players broadly interacting with other players. Uh, and, and will the resources live on chain or are they going to be off chain on chain on chain that's yeah. a lot of transactions i mean is, is every one resource its own um transaction on the ledger well i mean there might be certain game interactions that don't necessarily have to be on chain mm-hmm. transactions but just like every ship exists on the chain every resource will exist on the chain in some form or fashion right wow. and and will the will the planets be uh specific to one resource will you have to stake on an iron planet and then a lithium planet or will you be able to get a variety of resources from one planet it planets should have multiple resources okay. uh, i don't think it makes sense to for them to be like homogenous maybe there's some particular asteroid that's like just pure iron but mm-hmm. a planet will be heterogeneous and have multiple things mm-hmm. and and will players be able to level up their claims at this time or is that a future iteration not ready to, to share exactly how your your land claim progresses mm-hmm, um mm-hmm. because we're, we're fine-tuning some of those mechanics right now mm-hmm. but over time there, there will be some sort of progression and expansion of your your land claims that players can like aspire to and are you guys without giving details are you uh, ascribing time or time and money to those upgrades at both right so both okay we, we want to reward the players that engage in the game you know mm-hmm. consistently and put time into it 
but there will be an element of coming in and spending some money and you can you can progress faster because you bought maybe you bought from the marketplace the iron it takes to build this building rather than having to mine it yourself i, I, th mm -hmm. I think that's okay because players are also want want to have markets for selling the things that they they've mined right so that there the uh the demand will come from some, some people who want to you know build faster or or just buy the resources quickly mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we have a question from uh the chat here if you can answer it how long do you think from the start of cream do you anticipate the first ship being put on the market i definitely I, I won't I won't give an exact time frame, obviously, but mm -hmm. it, it should take time, like it's a good chunk of time, because bit like if a player starts cream and then is building ships within a few hours, the ships are just going to inflate like crazy. Right so we, we have yeah. to we have to put a lot of thought and we're there's like a lot of this game, like not not a, a lot of the game design is not necessarily just creating the mechanics and how you craft things, but also balancing the economy. So we're right. doing simulations and on, on like testing out a lot of iterations of our, of our mechanics and then balancing it based on like, um, batch runs of multiple players. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, I think a question that's on a lot of people's minds is we've got this, uh, process that's rolling out with cream, right. And, and we're not really staking into a, a 3d universe at this time. We'll, when the game goes live, if you have this information at this point, will we have to go out and find our planets again, or will we be allocated some planet that we've already been staking to? Yeah. So full transparency, we're, we're working on exactly how this will, this will work. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, there, like the one thing that, that I'm confident in is that the, the progression you have in your mini game should translate towards the unreal engine five experience um and we're working like we're working through exactly what it means when you stake land and build up all these all these um i guess settlements on all these planets it, how does that translate to unreal engine 5 there, there's little things here and there like um we, we're we're not going to release the, the high risk zone and the medium risk zone and like immediately right so maybe mm -hmm. some of this land is just in this in the security zone and we can kind of sequester all of the land associated with this mini game in, into certain starter regions, right? Mm -hmm. So that is some of the things we're thinking through right now. I think the the importance of that question from my perspective is, you know, many of the guilds, especially the larger guilds, are trying to understand how they're gonna put their footprint into into space, whether it's safe zone or the other zones. And if 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 current decisions have an impact on future decisions that we just don't know about that could create some tension down the line, right? We, we want our guilds members to be close, not spread out across the universe. Yeah, I, I remember Funcracker posed this exact question multiple times mm -hmm. to me. It's like, I don't, we don't want to engage in all these land purchases, but then the game comes out and our guild members are all over the place and we actually mm -hmm. can't cooperate that well. It's like friction because we had no choice in where we placed our land. So well aware of this concern and, and like, our intent is to not have that problem when we do transition to Unreal Engine 5. Fantastic. So you came on board to be a part of the shipbuilding piece. And I know they've announced, I think, 51 ships. Um, where where are you in that process? Do you have your fingers on every ship or are you more at a high level and then the designers go and design? So Danny and some of our other, like, team members they they manage the art pipeline mm -hmm. i i'm not really involved in that um and so a lot of it is is conceptualization design language getting the right metrics because we also have to think about well the interiors of these ships are going to be navigated by these player sizes so there's a lot of thought that goes there that i'm not involved in the part that i am involved with is when we're ready to um list these things to the marketplace and defining the the loadout Danny and I work together to define that. So when you you just had a um, well, I, I don't want to call it a glitch, but there was a concern in the community about loadouts with the air bike, right? Can you yeah. explain what happened? Yeah. So when we when we originally posted that the air bike, we had 
a zero for the missile bay and the the weapons hard point and understandably like the community was like well, what does that mean right it's, it's confusing um what it was and we removed that because we, we're just trying to we, we want to limit the confusion it, it didn't it, it doesn't impact gameplay right now but what it was was we wanted to imply that when you build when you manufacture the ship in the future those other component slots will be optional um you can manufacture the, the thimble without those those attached but later on you can unlock the ability to to attach those those components and, and when you one of the oh, things sorry one last point was mm -hmm. that to to lower the price point associated with that we also removed the, the weaponry um and it say if you attach the weapons or uh it would be up to like a twenty dollar twenty twenty five dollar ship most likely right so are you saying there's going to be a base price sorry banjo uh for whatever weapon that would have been on there it, so if it's five because now I'm, I'm just thinking like so that's five dollars if you jump unless twenty dollars wasn't the actual price but what does that look like as far as like the price ranges for weapons yeah um i don't necessarily think we have internally we, we don't have metrics associated with this is the price of every component and module because a lot of that is going to be community driven sure. but we did lower the intentionally lower the price point of the thimble and got rid of the weapons and now it's okay. like a budget ship but players through progression will be able to unlock the ability to to add the weapons to their thimble air bikes nice and and with cream so we've talked about crafting ships are we going to be correct crafting components and modules as well then oh, yeah oh that's fantastic and, and you know another common question that shows up uh, in the chats is, will there be a fail rate on building? You know, can you, can you fail a ship? I don't like that mechanic. Do, do you guys like that mechanic? Well, I don't. I, and, so yeah, what do you guys think? Either. Yeah, so I'm, I'm thinking on the R&D uh, side of things. So there might be uh, something additionally that you have to do because something fell through the cracks or wasn't yeah. able to be constructed right the first time, which would potentially take more from you, whether it's you know, right. Atlas to buy the extra component or time to then go search to bring that part back or more resources to refine. So uh, you, it's not like you, you're going to hit the, the jackpot and get a legendary weapon to put on your thimble. It's not like that RNG, but um, uh, but I think there because if we're talking about this being reality on some level mm -hmm. where the physics come into play, which so people yeah. make mistakes. So depending on uh, if you did have all the, the correct uh, um ingredients to make this weapon module let's say if it was that mm -hmm. there could be a, a percent chance where you're going to need to do a little bit more yeah. where it put more time in i guess but I, I, don't see, I don't see pass fail as making sense because again yeah. if you're in the process of creating something you may like oh crap i screwed this up so i need more of this resource so maybe the resources that go into the blueprint mm -hmm. have flex and if it worked out great, then it's really efficient. But then if you're also not very skilled at it, maybe that comes into play, whatever your skill is in this in this process as an engineer, perhaps. So you might use less resources uh, for crafting that. But a, a complete fail to where everything's gone, that wouldn't make sense. Yeah, I've, you know, seen, I've seen where there's that element of you can save reagents. Like you yeah. have a, a, a percent chance of saving some reagents, which mm -hmm. I think it would be nice. Um, as you increase your your manufacturing skill, I, I just I'm concerned. If, and and I don't think this was the intent, but if if you're crafting a ship and you have and you're putting a hundred dollars of, of supplies into it and it fails and a player just loses a hundred dollars, I don't I don't think that's fun. Like, right. Uh, maybe they had to pump in two dollars more and fix the the defect or something. That but um, but I'd have to put thought into if that if that would be a mechanic that would be worth right. investigating. I, I do think about. Like I played Elder Scrolls Online, where you, you're upgrading um, armor, and you have to put in the upgrade reagents. And if you put fewer than required for 100% mm -hmm. success chance, then then it fails. But players mm -hmm. like gambling, like hey, maybe I can save some of this upgrade reagent and gamble on an 80% success chance. Um, but there's no real money tied to that. Now we're talking about real money, and if mm -hmm. players are gambling, they're crafting. I, that, that might be a bit of a, a gray area, right? Yeah, and it might not sit yeah. well with the majority of people if they 
thought it was going to be a hundred dollars, and now it's one hundred two dollars. Even though it's only two dollars, they're just yeah. going to be like, "What? This is a sink. Yeah. This is like, like an wow. endless." <laughs> yeah. yeah. Every time I craft, I'm potentially going to have to pay up to one to twenty dollars. Or but that, but that kind of makes sense. I mean, no matter what you're sure. building, if you're building a, if you're trying to uh, restore a car or something like that, there's going to be unknown expenses, and sometimes, <laughs> hey, this is the wrong part. I got to pay more. So I can see that working. I just think, buy a I house, think in general, buy all kinds of unplanned expenses. Right. I think in general, it's 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 not necessarily fun gameplay to to fail a craft, right? But we are dealing with an actual economy, and so if this was needed to be instituted as a way to you know, kind of adjust the economy. I, and be, Star Atlas being as open as you guys are with the public, I think that would be well received. So I think it's a thing that we would probably want to shy away from. And then, you know, if you need to kind of go there a little bit, maybe you do. I think uh, that's a good point. I, well, there are economic levers that we're going to have to like be kind of pulling. Um, but maybe there's some elegance onto how we pull those levers or what they are. Like maybe we can adjust the emission rates of certain resources on planets. Say there's just, we're just pumping out too much of this. Yeah. Um, maybe there's a little bit of wiggle room we can, we can implement there. Or maybe NPCs, it's like, the, maybe if there's NPC sellers or tradesmen, like they can ask higher prices for certain things right. that they, they yeah. need to purchase from them. I, that, would, that would be, what I would think would be the, the way we implement those economic levers um, rather than this um, kind of failure rate or this uh, right. kind of chance of having to spend more on crafting. So will the four R's be part of the crafting loops too? Will people be able to do f fuel, toolkits, you know, food? Is that going to be part of cream? Yes. So oh. it'd be since there's going to be ship missions, Mm -hmm. that players are going to be able to ha have to go on for certain things and certain progression that requires R4. We want that to be a player generated resource as well. So it, it's, it'll be cool because it's, it's a closed loop, right? Players are sending out ships to explore land. Player stakes on land creates R4 and it goes back into the ship missions. So it's, it's, it's quite nice how, how it'll work out. So once that happens, will the actual infinite supply within the marketplace go away or will player created stuff be an additional option that may even lower the price of those resources? No, we've talked internally about we won't be selling R4 at infinite rates because we want we want there to be a period, an actual period per market that the, com the complex um, the complexity there is how do we transition off of our infinite mm -hmm. supply currently? Right. Um, and we're, we're talking with our, our economists about how, how to do that. So that Wait, you brought up the magic word chip to economists. So tell us about <laughs> how, how it works with uh, the economists on your team. Is it, are they just oversight or are they helping drive the, the underlying economy? It's, it's like, it's more, it's like a consulting model. They're, they're partnered with us. Mm -hmm. They, they help develop some of our models. We give feedback and it's, it's like iterative. Um, mm -hmm. And we're also hiring like internal economists as well because we want to beef out that that part of our internal team. So mm -hmm. it's where um, yeah, we're both. We have we have consulting services with with uh, third party economists, and then we're building out our own economy team right now. That's awesome. That's one of the uh, the biggest things about these these metaverse economies that are being created is that nobody's ever built one before, and that's one of the things I like most about your project is you guys you know take it very seriously. You know, just every time you guys say economist, it just makes me feel a little safer. I think like economy and community are the two biggest things for our yeah. game, right? If you don't have if you don't have both, then you don't you don't have a game that is like this true metaverse uh web three kind of gameplay experience that everybody's racing to 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 market right now. Right. Yeah, I, I would say out, out of all the projects that I've seen across the the metaverse, and the thing that always drew me to Star Atlas is that it seemed to be building on a solid foundation of economics first, and then everything else is layered on top of that. And I think that's the way it really has to be if you're going to have longevity uh, for what they're trying to create. Yeah, you know. And, okay, go ahead. Sorry, I was just going to go in no. a separate direction. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, so there's like. When we think about blockchain games, there's, and I don't know the answer. What what is what is going to be the most successful? It's but there's like the the traditional 
big game companies that know how to how to make games, but they they don't know how to do blockchain yet. And then there's like we're like fundamentally we're, we're like focused on blockchain technology and we're and we're building a game. And eventually we meet in the middle somewhere on like metaverse experience and it, and. Um, we're hedging on like being the, the first to market on 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 chain gaming, and then we can and we're working with third party, um, and we're built we're building out our team too to to have those like high AAA like fidelity experiences, but with the foundation of like the blockchain. Right. Um, so, but I know that other AAA studios out there they're they're thinking about and some of them are like NFTs. They're like. They're gonna have to catch up because there's, some of them are, are are denouncing it, and eventually the community is in the world is gonna be like, no, this is the future. This is what we want. They're gonna have to play catch up. But I'm sure there's other there's studios out there looking into this, and they might have a, a head start on the whole like game studio infrastructure, but they they might be like very nascent on the blockchain stuff. Mm -hmm. And there's opportunities for other developers to create the back end to incorporate the two worlds, right? There's yeah. somebody's going to come out and say, Hey, we've got the product to turn your game into a blockchain, uh, you know, game. Yeah. You know, one, one of the things, speaking of ships and, and earning right now, we're staking, everyone can stake their fleets. Um, when we get to the fully realized game, will people still have the ability to manage entire fleets or is it really just getting in your spaceship and flying and you only have access to one of your ships at that time? directly i mean not not counting scholarships or anything like that so it's gonna it's gonna be both like you're gonna be able to manage your fleet from a high level like mm -hmm. like merge a bunch of ships together into one group and then task them but then a, pl a player will also be able to jump into their one physical ship and and do more first person type interactions and have some sort of benefit associated with that it, it'll be both um, and I think like, not think I, I, I've communicated this in the past that the higher level third person interactions are going to dominate initially because the blockchain limitations, mm -hmm. it makes more sense to have RTS type interactions, but that doesn't mean we're not working towards those first person gameplay loops. Like that's mm -hmm. actually one of our priorities. Like Dan, like Danny's always, always talking about how we want players to jump into a ship and engage with a certain crew station and like do first person interactions and there'd be a reason for players to do that. Well, you know, we talk privately about um, uh, Star Trek Bridge Commander, I think it's right called, right? And it would be awesome to have a loop or something like a showroom where a group of guys or, and girls can get in there and, and maybe run a few game loops together um, before they are out in the fully realized space, right? Yeah, I. Danny has mentioned things like that, like using that particular game as, as like a as a source of inspiration for some of the experiences we're trying to foster. Mm -hmm. um, so, well, so, and that there. that hits the community piece, right? If you you've now got a community of people who are trying to solve a goal together, over voice, getting stressed out, making yep. mistakes. And I love them. the idea of like somebody's like face being on the screens in the ship <laughs> and, like, as a commander like commanding their their, That's their awesome. players like I, I don't know if we're gonna do that but i would love to have something like that especially when we start leading more into the metaverse um i think i think that'll be fun and it'll be there'll be so many memes so many youtube yeah, videos yeah. like it'll be the twitch will be like it'll be just great Tons so. of them. <laughs> um I, I do i just want to ask a question about weapons we did cover a little bit about that earlier but uh will there be any swords of any kind are there going to be only projectile type of weapons and you know maybe not talking about specifically ships but what you'd carry on your character so to be honest i've been focusing mostly on, on ship weapons but okay. i do know like crew are going to have gear and there's going to be weapon slots just like that that bounty hunter has a sniper I wouldn't be surprised if we have some sort of um, like sword type weapons. Um, I can't confirm it because I haven't seen any any of that yet, but it wouldn't be surprising that we implement things like that. Okay, because uh, what's a Roman without a sword? Just exactly. for, we, we have to have our, our citizenry out there with the, to protect themselves in the event of anything. So yeah. thanks. <laughs> so with, um, 
with cream coming chip dough and, and you already acknowledged that we'll be able to craft modules and components is that just for ships or we'll be able to do that for the mining operations as well um and for the people who own mining operations will they get some degree of air dropped crew um, or components i haven't heard about because we airdropped we airdropped them the, the the poster holders we airdropped them the the miners mm -hmm. and but then we're going to airdrop them more components and crew I, I actually haven't seen confirmation that we're going to airdrop more but also i don't the intent is that sh like structures will have some sort of upgrade progression mm -hmm. whether it's higher tiers or some sort of like module slots that you can put in. Um, I know we're going to allow crew to be in, in in buildings as well long term, but that's not necessarily part of the initial cream release. So, um, yeah, I, I, I can't put a definitive answer on, on that particular question. But other than I do think ships will be upgradable and there will be like modification slots and, and crew slots and it'll there'll be some there'll be some fun gameplay there. Yeah, I think it, where that question comes from is um, Wagner has said in the past that ship holders from the, you know, the GAO are going to get airdropped their crew and their modules that are attached to those assets. Yeah, well, I can confirm that. That's what we're doing. Yeah. But as far okay. as extending that towards land, um, land structures and, and space stations and stuff, I, don't, I haven't heard any chatter about us airdropping things mm -hmm. um, associated with that. With some of the questions that have come up around modules and components, the thing that continues to surface for me is I'm curious, has there been any thought given to uh, are these components like hot swappable? I mean, does it mean you have to be in a spaceport? Can you actually have other modules and components on your ship that you can in space say, you know what, we want to retrofit things and hot swap things out? Or is that like it? you do it and it takes three days to modules? Pretty sure you'll have to be in a shipyard or a hangar to swap out um, components and modules. Makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. That doesn't mean you can't have components and modules in your cargo, but you have to swap them. Like you need to be docked and like uh, intentionally swap it out. It won't be hot swaps in space. So it sounds like you're a gamer um, or you've played some MMOs in your past. Um, are you using any of games for inspiration around the crafting? I recently have played, like, I've gotten addicted to Satisfactory and Factorio. Like, those games are super fun. Um, and I, I love the progression. Like, Satisfactory has a lot of material sciences behind some of the progression. Like, you think about you think about it, a lot of it makes sense. You know, there's an element of disbelief, suspension of disbelief on some of this stuff. But mm -hmm. I, I, I really like how clean their crafting progression is. And... Um, and using those games as inspiration. I also like the crafting system in No Man's Sky, personally. Yeah. Um, like it's, it's got like it's it's a nice blend of of chemistry and sci-fi. Like I really mm -hmm. like that, and I think that that's another source of inspiration for us. So, um, yeah, those are some of the games I'm looking at. Yeah, I'm glad we, you. We, go ahead, Ray. No, I'm just glad you mentioned No Man's Sky because of the the epic failure of what it you know the reputation of the game but the the gameplay was always something that i thought could be built upon and now we're here so yeah i you know i think we're uh i think we're at about 30 minutes left with you chip do would you mind if we just went rapid fire on some questions that we have for you and yeah sure let's do it let you jump at them okay. all right anybody else have a problem with that or want to get a question in that has needs a longer answer before we jump we do have one in the comments right now if any more characters or badges might be coming to the marketplace soon if i if i did know that the answer to that um i probably <laughs> wouldn't be able to give it <laughs> yeah okay or 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 chipto will give you the opportunity to drop any um alpha you plan to drop before we jump into the questions sure. if you have anything if you don't that's fine too yeah, and these don't have to be yes or no, just to preface this. If, if you need to elaborate, by all means. Mm -hmm. I don't have, like, my alpha usually comes out with good questions, so we'll just, we'll just jump in. Go. All right, cool. you got it, man. Let's go. So we're going to start on Titans, right? Okay. So will Titan ownership be faction-locked, or will a person from one faction be able to 
take their Titan to a different faction? So this is kind of a touchy subject to be transparent. I'd, mm -hmm. I'd like to approach this question from more of like a discussion with you guys. So yeah, um, I personally like the idea of Titans being faction locked. Like if, if you think about the Gusan, um, the, la the, the last stand, that is a lore based historical asset. Like mm -hmm. that, that the Sogman race used that as a last stand to protect themselves. Um, should that be in the visas or in the mud sector? Like I, to me, I, I would, I wouldn't necessarily like to see that. Um, so that's my opinion. Um, we're, 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 we are, as a company, we're, we're discussing the, the, the mechanics behind Titan ships. Um, but I want, but I know part of this question also relates to how should players use Titans or how would they be used in the game? And I'd like mm -hmm. to kind of pick some of your some of your uh, team's eve knowledge and ask what do you guys want to see what's your opinion on this i i have a few thoughts on on the titan um one of them is, yeah i absolutely think they should be faction locked because of the lore because i mean especially the size and design of these ships um but as something else we've also discussed on the show in the past is that uh, you know, and you don't have to answer this as a question, but we we're curious as to why they're being dropped in so soon because we feel like these big beasts of a ship are such a deciding factor of power that they absolutely, if they're going to exist so early on, they should absolutely be faction locked as to prevent someone from just going to Dutch auction and say, give me all three. I'm sitting here in Oni and now I rule the world. Uh, so from that regard, I, th I think it's important to have them faction locked. And then there's still a lot of unknowns, like, you know, if we as a guild, let's say that Rome decided to uh, pony up the funds for uh, a big Titan, like, do we also incur like this $100,000 a month uh, ongoing maintenance cost to keep this thing going? And what does it allow for us to do that we couldn't do with land purchase? So there's just so many unknowns around the Titan. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that goes right into the question, Jesse, of what, what did developers how do they think they're going to show up in the game? I mean, it, we, they're going on auction this year, and, and there has to be some expectations of what people are going to do with it after they buy this big set of balls to drag through the metaverse, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> I, from a gameplay perspective, I certainly wouldn't want us to release Titans, and then it just becomes this force of unbalanced destruction associated with like land conquests and just destroying other people's assets like we, there's we we have we're putting a lot of thought into into these titans and what what they can do what limitations are associated with them how much they're going to be co cost to upkeep so i without you know giving hard and fast answers i'm just i just was curious what you guys your opinions are and like when 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 titans are introduced into the game what will be their primary utility are they going to be these powerhouses right. for a combat or are they going to be like like kind of bastions of defense for certain regions kind of thing yeah. and they're really expensive to move around kind of thing like I, i'd like to get your opinion well we've discussed uh, i can't remember if it was last episode or if we discussed it privately but we talked about them being the the instrument of boundary changes right so if, if a, a dao or a regional dao or maybe in a faction dao wants to adjust a boundary you can expect that the Titans will be there either in a defensive capacity or an offensive capacity um, because they, they have, well, I mean, we're theory crafting here, but they appear to have the firepower to at least hold a planetary system. Uh, that's my thoughts on it. And I, my biggest concern is the financial impact of them showing up. Um, right. I hope they are in game. I hope they are faction locked. Um, I want to fly around one, uh, but uh, to me it seems like it's it's a power struggle vehicle if we as a guild had one and we were to determine like what would we do with it the things that i would suggest is i would say i would say this is obviously going to be a home base we already have the cost associated with it it's gonna be a home base for our guild and we would probably i think it would make sense to find a resource that we could utilize its muscle to protect while we harvest resources be that in deep space because if you have that kind of firepower, you're pretty much going to be fairly uncontested for at least a period of time. And so make use of that by right. leveraging it to gain resources that are hard to get to. Yeah. And as a end game 
type of ship it would have a lot of impact on what people do for example if one guild doesn't have a titan but they want to go for a dyson sphere the guild with a titan could just stop them ideally uh, if they want like to be the sole person person to do that so it gives a lot of power to those who are at the top which is interesting yeah and and uh, i would think that just having any ship in particular doesn't mean that you would be uh, better in any way because I, w I would like to see a skill based type of situation going on with what you have uh, or what you've purchased or what you've built so you just because you have it doesn't mean that w any of these instances that we're talking about would be uh, anything to worry about because the, uh, but then again going a little lower into the variables of it all like uh, chip was saying what what is required and the up and then also the upkeep as we're talking about because if you can't use the ship and it's just there then it would get destroyed essentially by a, an onslaught of just continual attacks um, but you know the NPC crew could maybe only do so much compared to a human uh, group of people so it, it, it would be the, the humans operating their own ships would be the victors against the NPCs of that one person manning the titan you know like so there's mm -hmm. that balance but skilled playing and, 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 and utilization of assets would be the way to go instead of just having something and being at an advantage. Um, I, I think that's everyone's fear is, is the decided advantage that it could have. And it'd be cool if part of the auction required that your, your Titan has to live out in high risk zone with all the other Titans. Right. I mean, that would be, <laughs> that'd be awesome. Yeah. Right. Who, who, who's going to auction or, or well put their money on the line at that level. Well, that raises the question because there's a very important thing that guilds that have ships as resources need to at some point understand, and that is what is the firepower required to contest a Titan, to contest a C11, to contest a tree arrow. So if you are going to have this asset, you should know, like, if you see this fleet of XYZ show up, you are now at risk. And, and also someone that is a faction as a whole. Otherwise, can you just stroll into some other faction with your ship that hasn't purchased a Titan and then just run amok? So it's going to be mm -hmm. important to know, like, what is the the limits of strength before a fleet of other collective ships can contest what you have. I think the, the biggest question with that, what you just said, Jesse, is that nobody's going to really know for, for quite a while, you know, after the game launch, you know, what those mechanics are going to be, right? So a lot of people have a lot of money on the line, and then we're going to go out there, and we're going to PvP, and we're going to test each other, and we're going to find exploits. And, you know, the people who are in there early, you know, some of those people are going to get hurt a little bit, you know? So that's something that, you know, everybody needs to be aware of. That would be like sad and but not funny and kind of funny at the same time. If like three days after someone buys a Titan, everyone just oh wrecked him, that Titan gone. <laughs> oh man, it, it would be terrible. <laughs> yeah, and and I tend, I to, I tend to think that uh, you know, just uh, going back to the Titan bit, I think tend to think that Titan should be more defensive and less offensive in capability, just for that reason. Yeah, I think it should be rather hard to destroy one. I think you should be able to move with Titan. And it kind of dominate a space, but at the same time, going around and planet killing and things like that, you know, I mean, that's kind of dangerous. Well, it's, it seems like a, a good first start, maybe the first year or two, is they live in sp safe space, right? They're not anything that can really kill you. You can't kill it. It's just a fixture and maybe feeds the lore uh, of the metaverse before they start allowing it out into medium space and high risk space where it has some um, greater impact on the game. I like personally speaking, I think that is a good approach because you kind of if if you if you just throw them in there and let let people go at it immediately and without having some sort of kind of trial period with PvP on a smaller scale, you're just asking for trouble. Like I think mm -hmm. there's just a lot of unknowns that we're gonna have. So think the assets like that. I think it'll make sense for them to be. And this I'm not speaking like. Mm -hmm. Like this is how it's going to be. I, I would think that they would be more defensive in nature at the beginning. They would be like, I almost think of them as mega structures that can move a little bit, right, um, right. because there's going to be mega structures that, uh, like, you build up this planetary star system, you get a Dyson sphere, you get some other like mega structure. Like, there's going to be some upkeep costs associated with that, but it'll be lucrative from another standpoint as well. As it'll provide mm -hmm. a lot of benefits. So maybe these titans are kind of like mega structures that can move. 
Well, you, you brought up mega structures, and I think there's that's another ambiguous topic that hasn't really been fleshed out in town halls. If things like Dyson spheres. Uh, do you guys have a timeline? Like two years after we're live, we see our first Dyson sphere, or what? Because they are in other games. That type of project is instrumental to travel across the metaverse, right? Um, do, do you guys see a, a timeline for motherships in in Dyson spheres before the launch of the game, or will it come afterwards? I'd say that those mechanics come online um, around the time that we do location locked gameplay, where you're physically mm -hmm. moving in space, physically taking um, territory on a 3D map. If, I don't think it makes sense to have that type of stuff until we we release that. Mm -hmm. And it's it's well known, like it's known that on our roadmap that we're gonna have some location unlocked gameplay first associated mm -hmm. with minigame before we we transition to this full three D thing. Mm -hmm. In many ways, I had hoped that that would be the case with the Titans, meaning like it gave each faction something that, as a faction, they could perhaps work towards together. Um, rather than it just being this thing that shows up. And I'm sure that as a part of the lore and development, there's some reason for bringing them front and center so early on. But I would have liked to have seen something that massive be a project that the faction worked towards. Yeah, yeah. if we're going to have like a big uh, spaceship like this, um, I would uh, just like to know that it's mortal, that it can bleed. Like when it, if one dies out in space, it'd be like a whale dying in the ocean, all the little creatures would come for their piece of it. That would be really <laughs> awesome. <laughs> and yeah, I think that would be great. And then also, I was just thinking as we were talking um, that there should, I would I would like if there was a human requirement for any of one, one of these titans to even move. So it, it has the potential of moving, but there needs to be some like group or guild activity that you meet a threshold or you check off certain achievements where then you can possibly use it for anything offense defense uh attack or, or whatnot not just from building it and then now you have it and you can operate and shoot and move and take it where you want to go within your faction if it's faction bound but there needs to be right right there needs to be like a, yeah, yeah, exactly. like a hercules effort to mm -hmm. operate yeah. this thing it's not like a click and, and attack and it just destroys yeah. things that's yeah. yeah. an interesting I, I like that idea expensive as well right it, it should be yep. expensive yep. to move it one and, and expensive to arm it. it it should make people think twice around what they're going to do with it from an expense right. perspective before they actually, you know, take action. Also, or also, another idea I had is that if the, if guilds or VCs buying it for a particular guild to man and to earn a return on it for whatever reason, uh, for whatever the purpose of a, of a guild or an individual acquiring one of these through the Dutch auction, um, there should I think there should be a uh, a ranking of guilds that would qualify. So not just anyone could have the I don't, I don't know i'm just going I'm, I'm just like theory crafting and talking out loud here but if there was like a ranking system um although anyone could build it it would take so much time where you rat you probably wouldn't to set forth on doing that with your minimal amount of players in a guild but if there's if there's a way that any any one guild or or uh for a ranking to improve over time where it would make made it possibly easier but then I, I don't know something about uh ranking of guilds and then them being able to do xyz um in some way when it when it comes to the time ship well like here, here's an idea and we're just theory crafting now so you know so maybe some of you guys have played stellaris where you, to get certain assets or certain things in the game you need to upgrade your your, your star port or star base and so maybe to even craft a, a titan you need to oh like you need your guild needs to own the star system and build up right. the infrastructure and maybe right. you need a, a mega structure alone to even craft the titan ship right like this mm -hmm. giant yeah. mm -hmm. giant right. um shipyard um sure. that it takes just a herculean effort just to get to that point and then somebody needs to have the blueprint which hmm. um will be an effort in, in and of itself and then all the all the resources to build it and it might take a, a while for this thing to be built like people will be watching it um yeah. Yeah. take this like start from a skeleton and over months you know right be, be built i think that would be really cool also, and, be, and that makes it this thing that now is created from people who are actively engaged in the gameplay process uh, yeah for it to even be able to be the bear fruit 
Mm-hmm. Sorry, yeah. sorry, just I thought you finished when you were talking, but I, I did mention in a previous episode that before a Dutch auction of anything this year for Titans come out, there should be a, a, an effort amongst the community to work towards building one out once we have cream and we're able to harvest and you know acquire resources so it's not just bam someone bought it but there's there's a productive effort amongst guilds that would foster more engagement and more activity in the market and to to build out the economy i guess in that way um to then so now you like we were just saying there's that long-term effort seeing it being built or having a bar you know whether it's zero to 100 percent of how how far along a guild is getting with just the resources within its uh, wallets that are cumulative in the organization when that's live, you know, like, so, so it's just like a, a, a live tracker of resources. If they decided where yeah. you're capable of, of creating one. Oh, something like yeah. That. Like a, um, like a faction initiative or something where you guys yeah. have to pull resources to unlock certain content. That, yeah. That's pretty neat. But I, I would say on, on this topic, if like the community doesn't like something, like I encourage community to like speak up and, and, and sure. make that known, right? I, I hear you loud and clear. I, I have my own opinions on this. Um, but yeah, I would, I would encourage you guys like ask the questions to the team at large and, and poke at it kind of thing. Mm-hmm. I like this idea on the screen here. I think that's a great idea. I'd like to yeah. see it sold as a blueprint. That way there's still a mechanic involved mm-hmm. where it's being built out. And it's not this thing that becomes immediately disruptive to both gameplay and the economy. You know who has it, but you also understand that there's this build out process. And, and yeah. also the optics of it too, from the outside, the legacy gamers coming into the space. If there's already all this you know, ship and power that an, an, a guild has, whether we have the real engine five out or not, it, it, it would deter people from coming and even trying to even get involved. Yeah. Yeah. Personally, it never occurred to me that the Titans would be sold. I always kind of figured that they would be crafted. So um, I, I definitely agree with Ronald there on that one. And then uh, Monty made an interesting comment earlier about human crew only. I don't necessarily agree. Uh, with the idea of you have to have all humans playing a, a, a ship of that size. But um, I know we've talked in the past about, you know, there being an advantage to having more human players versus NPCs. Um, perhaps there's a percentage, like you have to have so many humans to be able to operate a Titan, you know, just to kind of balance it out a little bit to where it has to be a, a bigger communal or guild effort. That's a cool sure. idea. I, I do. I do like it that there's a minimum like human interaction required to, to do certain things. Um, Otherwise, could you imagine like one person in his, in, in his <laughs> NPC cruise, just cruising around. The Titan? It's just, it's just yeah. Elon or Gates driving around. That Titan, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, there are, there are people out there that have, that have that kind of money though, you know, where they could kind of fracture a game. I mean, I've seen it in the past with some, uh, some of the like more sandboxy type games where people were able to buy certain things and pay to win and dominate yeah i definitely wouldn't want to see as it happened as it happened in eve online when the titans were introduced it was like such a gargantuous achievement to get one and then it became commonplace now with every yeah. war it's just like that's the number one ship in mass that you just see with like lasers and it's like oh, no. it kind of gets yeah it's kind of gets ridiculous yeah so speaking of legacy gamers um we know that there's going to be a, a transition when the crypto community starts it all out and then we try to get the the legacy gamers in how how complex do we anticipate flight being especially combat flight right so we've got different examples of games that we can pull from and some are very basic where you just point and click and kind of move around and some have you you know all the way down to moving power around to different systems in your ship how how in depth do you anticipate you guys going so I've spoken near term is going to be like an RTS, but I, I have heard Danny mention that like he likes the feel of Star Citizen's flight, and that could be a source of inspiration for us. So that that that's as best as I can answer it right now, as far as like maybe a, a long term goal for for us. Yeah, I think a lot of people are starting to learn um, what it means to fly with the joystick. Uh, versus a keyboard it, it in some of those games it absolutely requires a level of skill that um, keyboard warriors don't have right now it's it's a joystick game and i'm just curious I, and i haven't played star to citizen so i don't know but is it keyboard or joystick it's um, 
I, I think it lends itself toward, towards keyboard, and I've only watched players play it like Twitch streaming, so I, I think it's it's both. Got it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, when the racing gameplay loop enters at whatever point, I would hope that at some point it becomes very tactile and, and joystick oriented. That would make the racing a lot more fun, not just from the aspect of the person in the in the seat racing, but also the spectators and all of the speculation and all the other things that will go into that sort of thing. Yeah, like some of the thoughts are some of those kind of real time interactions, they don't necessarily occur on chain. Like you, you, mm-hmm. you go into this kind of um, instance that duke it out, and then the result gets posted right. or broadcast yeah. on chain, right? So mm-hmm. we could do, we could potentially do that with, with combat. We could do that with racing. Um, I think that there will be some, some uh, like technology and, 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 designing around the limitations associated with things like that. When Well, you mentioned racing. Uh, um, sorry, Benjamin, did you want to move on? No, go ahead, man. Yeah, so, so when it comes to racing, you know, there's, there's games like Pegaxi and, um, you know, the type of games where it could be a 2D, you see your ship kind of moving along your screen against others, and then, like, is there any type of... Where, where are you guys maybe in the development stage of that, and do you have any a significant role in, in what the racing aspect of the game is going to look like? We we have racing on our timeline and as part of as part of like our intended feature release, but we we haven't been okay. developing that out yet. Sounds good. So yeah. so one of the things that was brought up or at least alluded to is that Cream might include um, faction NPCs. Is that accurate? Like getting quests oh. from from. Oh NPCs? yeah yeah yeah. There'll be there'll be NPCs with and, give and, quests. And will we start building loyalty at that time? Will it start? driving the the loyalty that we've seen in some of the ship um, documents that have come out recently? When the dependency on ship ship crafting and a lot of crafting does depend on the loyalty system. So Mm -hmm. those will be like, there'll be a dependency there. When, when Mm -hmm. that gameplay comes out, there will be ship loyalty associated with, with it. And is there a way for, let's say an Oni person to gain loyalty in the, in cream, uh, the initial version of cream with other factions or will it only be interfaction so whatever oni has access to based on the the aligned company document that'll be the initial like exposure to what they can build and then then faction passes get implemented and if you want to unlock more access you know, that that'll be the the mechanism for doing so mm-hmm. um but like I, I do think that even if you buy the faction passes, like it's it's still going to be an effort to to uh, like unlock all those blueprints, and you might be at a disadvantage because your faction doesn't have access to all the uh, resources or as high abundance of the resources that are required for those blueprints. So it's like, great, you have access now. Now you're going to be buying that at a, at a premium, the resources at a premium on the off the marketplace to build those ships, whereas yeah. the 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 um, the factions that that's their native companies, it'll be easier for them. And is loyalty one direction? So for example, if I can gain loyalty with everybody or can I lose loyalty with working with one faction against another? So the, like the, the bi-directional loyalty stuff, that that's more like there's, there's loyalty associated with with getting blueprints and then there's like faction standing kind of thing. Mm-hmm. I think mm-hmm. those are slightly divorced, right? Okay. So, um, yeah, I do think you, maybe there's faction standing, especially when you start doing the the risk zone, banished faction type stuff that can go in multiple directions. But I don't think you accumulating points with peers would impact your your standing or your loyalty points with like Calico or another manufacturer, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, if you think about it, there is a there is uh, a way you could get into that, because I'm sure like the Ecos people are not happy to be working with people who support peers. Right. I mean, they're that you've got somebody who's, I guess, peaceniks through through bombing, but then a, against somebody who might be more military minded. It, it seems to me down the line, there's an opportunity to put that in place somehow. I agree. I think the interesting dynamics will be with the banished factions, and mm-hmm. that'll be where 
Like, I don't want to talk too much on that because that's that's <laughs> risk zone kind of yeah. fun gameplay that we're keeping in our back pocket for now. Don't don't want to ruin the, the some well, of the you, the awe associated with yeah. experiencing it for the first time. But that's where a lot of the interesting stuff will play out. I don't think the the interfaction uh, and the like faction native uh, manufacturers are going to be the ones that have these complex di- like rep dynamics. Well, you call them I, banished I, factions. So <laughs> that's a little bit of an alpha, I think. I don't know. I, they've been. I, I don't think I'm the first person to say that, but that's that's what we we have them named as. A, they're the banished factions. Cool. Yeah, outliers. They're not a part of the the, the main sector for sure. Uh, with the um, with the the ships and the blueprints, one thing that comes to mind for me is like there might be. It would be interesting to have blueprints for ships that are provided as a loyalty so in other words if i'm a ship manufacturer and i'm like building any one ship that i can get a blueprint get my hands on that's a little bit different than if i am a if i'm trying to get a blueprint i only manufacture these ships so therefore i have some loyalty to this ship line and so therefore i can i get access to these blueprints that are specific to the ship line because of my loyalty yeah and i personally so here, here's the alpha i'll drop right about about this because it's been on my mind a lot with with blueprints i am lead, i'm leaning into the idea that say you unlock a specific ship blueprint um that blueprint itself has a progression associated with it so it's not just one and done by by the blueprint and now you build the the x4 it's like well you can keep investing into that blueprint and it gets better over time i I think that that'll be really interesting. So that way, some people specialize in this one ship, not not necessarily just a manufacturing line, but a specific blueprint. And then we, I don't think we've talked much about this, but blueprints aren't only ships. There's other there's blueprints for other things in the game. Mm. Modules, components. Yeah, things yeah, like that. Um, so when it comes to blueprints, is there going to be percentage chances of you getting it, or is it uh, required after you've done a certain action? Is there going to be a mixture of both or you know, randomized asteroid harvesting blueprint? Wow, I got one. I think there will be a guaranteed way to get a blueprint. So you, okay. you purchase a blueprint for this price, but so, some blueprints might be like locked behind other content that could be random. Like go, you know, I, I don't know if it'd be this simplified approach, but like, and wow, you go, you go kill all these mobs and you'll get a chance at a drop. Maybe you go kill a bunch right. of these pirates and some, sometimes they drop a blueprint. Who knows? Right. I think that'd be fun too. Yeah. Right. Cause, because I'm thinking maybe there's only, there's blueprints you can only get through storyline, through a, through an adventure mode storyline that yeah. would also help you in your PVP because now you have the intersection of people who just care about PVP having to do P- PVE and then PVE needing to go out there to progress within the adventure mode if they never wanted to. Cause you have a lot of people on the side, like, like yourself uh, may possibly if, if you're not that PVP type of guy, but you want to, and you're that hardcore adventure guy, it's going to be like, you can't really enjoy adventure that much because you're not going to, you'll still be able to complete it maybe, but you're not going to have that full experience of adventure. If you don't dabble in the second or third zone, um, some solid PVE to get, incentives yeah. to, to get some blueprint that's required to you to fulfill the, 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 the full, in, the full um, uh, walkthrough or playthrough of the adventure. Well, I'm already, I'm already aware of, of one ship that we're, we're keeping for like content unlock. It's, oh, cool. I love this ship. So like, I'm excited for when players oh, discover it. Can you give us the first letter of the name of the ship? <laughs> <laughs> uh, can you give a color of the ship? Okay. <laughs> no. Uh, but I, I know this, this ship, people will love it. <laughs> well, okay. It's one of my favorites. So. Can you uh, paint for us maybe a little bit, Chipto, what it's going to look like for PVE? Um, in, in safe space, are there going to be pirates? Are there going to be, um, you know, faction forces? What what can we expect to go up against if we're not a PvP or? So, um, if you're in the secure zone, like you're you're secure. I don't think that there's not there's going to be very rare instances of PVE, if any. When you venture out into the lower security zones, um, that's where you will have those random encounters with with the Jorvik and the Ecos, and eventually you'll, you'll, you'll run into the Tufa in certain instances. Um, and uh, that, that'll that be, the, it's almost like NPCs scattered around the place and they'll be roaming and you'll run into them and, and you'll either engage them or flee them and there'll be drops associated with that. Um, 
what one idea that I've seen thrown around in the foundation room, and I like it. I, I can't. I, I don't know if this will actually make it into the game, but I really like this idea. Is is like area bosses, so like these giant That's like cool. NPC yeah. monsters, or or mm -hmm. even like souped up pirate ships that would be really cool to have fleets kind of, you know, take out. And I don't know if it'd be if we like the the respawn mechanics. Like how how, how do we handle that? Because we don't just want it to like just appear out of nowhere. Like I I don't mm -hmm. know. If, I don't think we're going for that level of, of un, like unrealism or whatever yeah. the word is, but um, I, I like the idea of like space monsters and world bosses and stuff like that. I, it yeah. just, I, it's like the MMORPG experience, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. It's very exciting. I'm sorry. I'm just um, biting at the bit to just say something, but maybe there's a beacon that you can acquire from adventure or from, you know, uh, finding it. And then you don't know what it's going to bring or call into that oh, region or fashion. Yeah. So, so it's not just respawning over X amount of time, this new monster or same monster that looks the same way because that could get redundant and then tedious if it gets stronger and stronger every time it's defeated. Like that could be another component where now it requires even more people, uh, more humans or NPCs or more ships that you need to purchase and to upgrade. So now this continual uh, monster, if we want to call it that, that does come back, it grows and grows to this thing where it, it's always going to be there, not necessarily yeah. destroy anyone, but it could probably consume and and, um, and affect the planet's resources and whoever owns that planet. So you'll get rewards for destroying the monster, but the larger it grows and now it impacts that environment of maybe the planet you own, and now you have to move, and what happens <laughs> to the planet? Yeah. Like, yeah. Th there could I mean, be some... So, yeah. Uh, so, so beacons that you don't know what's going to come, and you can that, then you guys can get even more creative, and you can have an onslaught of just ideas to work with. Well, what, I guess mm -hmm. uh, one one last like point on on this is like something. One thing I've been thinking about is maybe you do find find one of these beacons or one of these locations of these monsters, and you're like I'm no way equipped to handle this. Well, you can like tag it and then go and sell that on the marketplace like this is yeah. information and then somebody can buy that and go like take out take it out whatever or guilds sure. can buy it and go take out these world yeah. bosses but at least a person who is exploring has you know they're, they're rewarded for their right. efforts right yeah. yeah right and then also you can sell it or use it to potentially disrupt uh something like a titan being built you know it could you could just open it up somewhere like uh, in a different faction <laughs> on your on your second account you just get it you take your x4 or you know your jet your yeah. opal jet and then uh, or whichever whichever one that has warp drive and then you can just like <laughs> open it up in someone else's and then just, just like leave open um, pandora's box and run yeah, yeah. <laughs> That'd be interesting. one of the other pieces that we've heard are coming to ships chipto is is charms do you have any information on charms at all it's it's another slot like there's components and module slots now there's going to be a charm charm slot and um there will be you equip your charm there'll be a certain buff associated with it it's just another flavor of a of a ship slot that you can equip things mm -hmm. but would it would a pet classify as a charm or would that be a crew member i think that's a that's a crew member um mm -hmm. you'll have crew slots i pets might have their own particular slot um yeah, we have so many different modular slots. It's going to be really interesting how it's it's going to be complicated. Like, there's going to be a lot of customization, a lot of like agency that the player gets to to build their ships and their fleets whatever way they want. That's awesome. Um, yeah. I I do have a question. Uh, so the story, the lore of the game, how flexible is it to incorporate a well thought out lore of a particular guild that wants to to more or less. Uh, have the, their guild's lore work with and or within the lore of the game in some way not to maybe maybe be added on if it if it adds so much value and enrichment of to the to the game and how it could be built out like is it a fixed thing where there's no chance of anyone creating lore uh to to add on or to have it be a part of uh i, I mean i wouldn't be surprised if if a guild gets to a point where they could be there on the banished faction i don't know like I like the idea of it. I, I don't think we actually plan that particular instance of happening, but I, it's not outside the realm of possibility. I think that could be something we enable, right? Have you heard about Rome's uh, relationship with Gala? <laughs> <laughs> I've heard, I've seen uh, tidbits of it. <laughs> I think we're a banished faction there. Um, Shipto, we, we are at 90 minutes. I want to make sure we're respectful of your time um do, do we need do you have a hard stop or? yeah i think i i think i have to hop off at this point um got other plans for today but this has been super fun and i yeah. i 
would love to come on at some point in the future again and, and talk more about the development since from now till then. Um, yeah, man, this was, this was a lot of, was a lot and of even fun. Just, minutes just flew. Yeah, yeah, and even if it's not to even drop any alpha and share any thoughts, just right. to have you on here to uh, participate in the theory crafting side is fun. Yeah, we've yeah. enjoyed having you for sure. Yeah, it's helps because like it's like a sounding board for for ideas too. Like for sure. just well, hearing some new ideas here is like just fuels kind of our development. And we like to idea. have a. Uh, I was just gonna say we'd like to have a revolving door with all of our previous guests. So feel free to reach out anytime if you want to hop on. Even if we're live stream, we've had some of our old friends come in, so it's all good. Yeah. And to that end, I think if you wanted to do a full theory crafting episode with with an agenda that's written by you, we can get the community right. involved in a big way. So I think that would be fun. Yeah, that, that sounds like something that we we can make happen. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, this this has been super fun. And yeah, I love all the, the, the community feedback. Everybody lo loves these talks. So I'm sure we'll do more in the future. You got so. it, man. Well, thank you so much for coming on. Um, you know, you're our first Star Atlas developer that's been on, and I think we nailed it. You know, we, we of course, would love to have others. Um, but you're a guy who really seems like he's in the weeds and really loves to talk about this stuff openly on the spaces and the town halls. So we're, we're very happy to have you. Uh, have a fantastic day. And then for the rest of the listeners, we're going to stay on and talk some more. So please feel free to stay, stop, uh, stay with us, excuse me. Uh, and if you want to find Chipto on Twitter, he is at Chipto underscore. Yep. Um, and I think Chipto was taken. <laughs> so, <laughs> and then I think um, on Discord, he goes by Chipto. I think you can search for Chipto and find him there. But of course, you can find him in the foundation room on Star Atlas Discord. Um, continuing on these very same conversations so thanks for coming man thanks guys and thanks um, to the team as well yeah appreciate yeah. it and yeah shout out to the star atlas team too yeah all this stuff it's for not sure. just me it's everybody so it's all right we're working hard we love the community feedback thanks for, for all the questions having me on and uh you guys have a good rest of your sunday and we'll be talking you, too, you got Drew. it man take it easy yeah, Later. well that was fantastic that, that was uh, that was great that could have gone on for hours. <laughs> for sure. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Me and me and Ray were crying backstage yeah. <laughs> looking at the time like, oh, Just man, it's yeah. over. <laughs> Teary emojis all over the place. Yeah. So we, we had a series of questions that we had lined up before. But, man, of course, those spawn all kinds of other ones. And it was hard. Mm -hmm. Just like, oh, girl, I'm going to ask this, too. <laughs> well, you know, I, I agree, Jesse. And, and it's kind of hard to take a list of questions and not let the conversation. We, we let the conversation go where it goes. Yeah. Right? That's what we do here. Right. Um, but you know what we might do is we might take some of those questions and just talk about them amongst ourselves. I think it's great. We'll do that. We've got a little bit of time. Is everyone okay with that? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So I think one of the ones that um, we didn't get to, uh, let me just find a good one. Um, well, I had one that wasn't answered. It was um, how good is a uh, two for camouflage going to be so if a data runner is going past would it see it if a normal ship is going past would it be able to like sense it or if like a small ship would it just be completely invisible pretty much i There's think a been. data runner would see it because the data runner seems to be at the high upper echelon of of data so it should be able to see it as where if you had something else like a a jet jet or even mm -hmm. i mean even who knows maybe even a hero i don't know something where they're they're probably not going to be as equipped unless they went out of their way to install the modules and components that give them that extra scanning yeah i think it's all a proximity thing right so uh like a a, a no pod might even in hyperspace be able to sense the tufa in the system if you will where a smaller ship might have to be right on top of it before it can sense it which is the advantage of something like an OPOD because you have distance as a defensive right. mechanism, right? Um, but if, if, I mean, a TUFA sitting in, a, in an asteroid field, having now gotten into some games where you're flying through those, you would never know. I mean, there's just no mm -hmm. way visually to, to make one rock look like or look different than another one, right? And then maybe there's an aspect of the Tufa where your skill based on flying it and the way that you use your stealth, or maybe it's been upgraded in a way that has extra stealth. So maybe even if the data runner gets a ping of a signal for it, it knows one's in the region or a ship is in the region, but it can't exactly isolate exactly where. Mm -hmm. So it's probably something like that. That'd be cool. And that's a, that's a mechanism that you see in a number of games. When you'd make a hyperspace jump into a system you automatically do a scan for what's there 
right? To see what's out there because in, in a right. game like Eve, if you don't do that, you're likely to get your you're likely to get killed uh, ultimately. Um, so again, it will be curious to see for those of people of us who own Tupas where where you'll sit um, in in some sort of ambush potentially. How how are you going to monopolize and, and maximize your ship to to make money and and grow your ship? I think there's so much opportunity there. Right. Because I'm thinking in order to. Do we have to get our ships to the shipyard to upgrade it? Because how are you upgrading a Tufas if they're just hanging out all day, um, you know, in, well, yeah. in this asteroid belt? So you, they're not always going to be a static group of Tufas if it yeah. was that one purchaser of 3,000 Tufas. Um, oh, and they would, have to, they would have to move around and, <laughs> and uh, you would probably have a chance to go through that same area and not experience an ambush. Yeah. Every time. Well, I agree with that, but how, wouldn't you want to be the guy with 3,000 Tufas and making his own <laughs> asteroid field? I mean, how oh, awesome yeah. would that be? Well, Absolutely. Like most awesome. Like, hey, it's a planet, and then hurt. it just transforms. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you guys think? That, oh, go ahead, Jesse. I was going to say something that he said that got me thinking about like how blueprints – you know that in in his world, he, and this is not to say this is going to be a part of the development process, but maybe that blueprints wouldn't just be this static thing. That once you have the blueprint, you're able to create this data runner. So maybe as you become more skilled as someone that can utilize this blueprint, or you've utilized, you've built it a number of times. All of a sudden, maybe an extra component or module mm -hmm. slot or something, kind of like you know how when you have a car line, there's like higher levels of car within that right. car line. Maybe Maybe you can create a better data runner because you have that experience as a shipbuilder. I agree with that, Jesse, because in my mind, a data runner, you know, I'm thinking you're going to be able to go out there and scan planets and find out, like, what kind of resources are on this planet versus another. And so if you're able to have that kind of capability on a whole planet, you I, you would think you'd be able to do something to be able to see what's inside of a two for feist. Just because yeah, right. it's, you know, a meteor on the outside doesn't mean that's what it is on the inside. You should be able to tell that. And so... I think like you guys were saying earlier, you know, the ones that don't have that level of technology, obviously, you know, even if they're a large ship, they probably can't scan that well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What, what did you guys think of the resource conversation? I, um, I, my, I had this image in my mind of what it was going to look like, and I think I have a different image of what it's going to look like now. Um, how do you guys anticipate that you'll show up? Uh, are you just going to stake all your land in one spot and, and draw resources, or how do you ho hope to approach the game? A clue that came of what he was suggesting there, and again, this doesn't lead to anything being exact, but it sounded as if the it might be land might only open up first within the safe zone. So if that's the case, mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. grab land, grab land wherever you can, unless there's mm -hmm. some other thing that says, hey, you can scan for land. And that in this region, there's more likely going to be the resources that you might want to have. So that's where you're going to get your land. But if we don't know and it's just a straight up, you know, a grab for land, then it's grab land. Unless we have any new information that says why this land over that land. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, uh, from, a, from a resource perspective, you know, we've had conversations in the past about, OK, I have $10,000. Am I going to go in Polis or am I going to go in land? And it's starting to feel like you might need to lean a little bit more into land. You know, Polis is going to have an emission tied to it, but it may not be as good as we think. We don't know yet. Yeah. Um, but if you really want to get the gun on crafting, um, you almost have to, by nature, have the resources available. And anyone who's done any sort of crafting in a game knows if you get your own resources, it's way cheaper. We have a, a news slide that if we get to it, we'll share it. But the whole concept is around that last year, 2021 in the metaverse there was 500 million in land sold and the anticipation is 1 billion this year any way you amazing. slice it in star atlas i think land is going to be a significant of significant value mm -hmm. so yeah mm -hmm. uh it's it's high on my list i'd say it's number one priority even for what i plan to accumulate from here i feel like i'm solid in the polis solid in the ship assets i really want to settle some land yeah, I think you made a good point there, Jesse, because you're 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 solid in the polis as well. Because I think the the polis is going to be the governance. So having land without having any polis is going to be a bad move, also, right? So it's, there's going to have to be some sort of a balance between the two. Mm -hmm. um, I agree with you guys probably as far as leaning into land in the short term before the governments the the governance part comes into play so heavily. But you know later on in the game, you know if you have a piece of land and and you get you know overtaxed or whatever because you don't have enough polis to you know defend yourself that's going to be a political play that's going to be happening 
And, and Wagner's been pretty clear that the, the Dow, the Polis Dow is the top level Dow. We won't see faction Dows and, and regional Dows for some time. Um, uh, Monty put a question into chat that I think is probably worth talking about because it was new information, right? Um, and, and the challenges of the game being on a blockchain is it introduces latency through approvals, um, which may make real-time combat a challenge that they're going to have to solve. Um, I, I don't think this is surprising, but I mm -hmm. think it's important for the community to know. Yeah. As someone that has been kind of feel sensitive to that as each day when I have to go through and have to prove <laughs> every single transaction for everything that's happening with ships and claims and this and that, my guess is, and of course, it, the more that you have a need for this, which there is, the, the metaverse will provide. There will be, you know, mm -hmm. the development ideas, thoughts, and resources will lean in this direction. My guess is that when you enter a combat area, you will probably at that point have to make an agreement contract wise and then it does its thing and making sure you have the necessary resources and things and then settles up thereafter so you're not constantly engaged in this approval process for yeah. transactions i was surprised that resources are going to be on chain because that's to me feels like something that should be off chain because if if you're moving ten thousand of or whatever or Mm -hmm. um, and you sell half and you have to establish that on the chain and hundreds of thousands of people are doing it at the same time. That's really going to put a lot of throughput transactions per second on the Solana blockchain. I think we're, Star Atlas is going to test the chain continually if, if that's the case. I agree yeah. with you on that, Banjo. That's something we've looked at with other games in the past is how much do we actually want to have on chain versus mm -hmm. uh, how much is it's going to prove the game bait the gameplay to not have certain things on chain so you know your, your your ship gets destroyed or gets damaged obviously that needs to be on chain um you get a resource okay that can be on chain but you know shooting missiles and, and things like that you know i mean that's gonna really clog up a blockchain if you really start trying to nitpick you know yeah. If someone was talking about things they're worried about the thing that keeps coming to my mind and i i'm i would that big money it's going to be a thing at some point and that is exploits we've seen exploits in every game out there every mmorpg anything that's multiplayer where people are able to use bots or whatever else there is some form of exploits well now that there is you know real money at stake here you know how quickly do you identify these how quickly do you plug them and what is the potential risk for things that you're not even considering. You go into deep space, you're there for the regular gameplay, but someone has identified an exploit that's able to take advantage of other people. Well, I think that's gonna come at the through the blockchain itself. I mean, there's gonna be people who are blockchain savvy who will code something to know when somebody jumps into this system and where they're at and um, how they can take advantage of that, whether by scalping them or always staying away from them. Uh, I think, Every guild that wants to play at the end game has to be ready for those types of tools and systems and, and roll with them. I don't think you can fight against them. I think that's going to go all the way down to people being able to track wallets and see where you're engaging and people having to have multiple wallets to be able to move around freely. I mean, it's, I yeah. think it's going to get kind of complex. It, it yeah. could even be some strange, silly thing like you're out in deep space and you go to barter something and they've written into it where uh, in addition to what you've bartered for, they, they actually just also offloaded all of your fuel <laughs> so you're stuck there <laughs> in deep space. <laughs> you know, it, it could be little simple things written into contracts, some strange way on chain. We don't know what they will be yet, but we've seen them. We've seen crafting exploits, fishing exploits in some games. Mm -hmm. They're, they're going to be there. It's a part of the growing process. Just the botting alone. I haven't played an MMO that doesn't have bots for crafting. And I um, I know this has been brought up on some of the town halls and they're going to work against it, but I just don't know how much, how much energy and money can you apply against something that somebody has got a vested interest in doing, right? right. Um, so at some point, I think we're going to see it and, we're, uh, and we may end up having to do it ourselves. I mean, it, it's one of those things where sometimes it becomes part of the game style. Mm-hmm. Um, Fancy, I think you said there was some new stuff on Twitter that popped up today. Yeah, just before our stream started, they <clears throat> uploaded something, and uh, wow, check this. Wow, 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 wow. So this is a uh, point of view from the showroom, it looks like. And you can 
might be able to just walk up to this and buy the ship. But uh, yeah. What do we think for scale? Like, I mean, it looks small right there, but does that mean it's small? Is that like a one seater? Mm. If it's even a seater at all, right? We don't. Yeah. We don't know. Or, or I mean, is it a drone? We've we've seen. I've never seen this model of drone, but we have seen the other one that kind of has like four legs. Kind of, we've seen it hanging off of the C11, the and yeah. in some art. Yeah. Well, so maybe I guess someone. Like they, I guess someone could be like flying flat, like flat in the middle of it, but I don't see much room for a cockpit there. Right. That's... Actually, I think we have seen this before. Now that I think about it, there is a picture of a drone tower with a bunch of drones flying outside of it. Huh. I, I'm almost certain that's the same picture. While we're talking, uh, I'll see if I can find it. Yeah, I seem to recall this because we didn't recognize it then either, but we saw mm -hmm. a bunch of them around the building or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Shout out to uh, Rob Mega and PG from the chat. They're thinking that's a, a weapon. And so, you know, maybe that's a, a module or maybe it's a, a drone weapon, which we haven't seen before because, you know, you could have attack drones as well as data drones. And I think we've probably only seen data drones at this point, right? And that's yeah, the other I, thing. This is the showroom. And so the showroom doesn't only show ships. Maybe that's someone checking out modules, like you're saying. Yeah. Uh, we have seen uh, data drones before. You can see them on this one. They're like, right. on, mm -hmm. I'm, I want to say the moon just because it's gray, but it's probably yeah. not. <laughs> and the Visa Zopod has them as well. Like, I think that we had a picture before of the Visa Zopod having some data drones uh, flying around it or something, didn't we? Uh, it's, it's not on this one. It's the only Visa we got at the moment. Oh, yeah. So but you saw them the on the bottom, on the belly of it, you know, and then they, I think they had one where they were kind of, a couple of them were out or something. Yeah. I got to delete a picture out of here to load. I found the, the one I'm talking about. Um, yeah, but um, it's a cool perspective, and it reminds me a lot of uh, one of the last showroom pictures we've seen, uh, where it's looking at an X4. If I can find it. Yeah, while you pull it up, there seems to be a description on the. There you go. So, uh, on the on the previous video that was just released today, uh, when it's at that that max angle at the end, uh, there's a description. I'm thinking on the far right, bottom right of the screen. So whoever can enhance that, get back to Rome. We'll pay you a handsome, handsome. <laughs> <laughs> so here's the drone tower, right? So they kind of look like that, but not quite. I mean, they kind of have the. Um, it's not very maybe pointy. this is the inspiration mm -hmm. but yeah perhaps a variation of that yeah mm -hmm. which which gonna... begs the question so in this particular instance are these things just doing what they do as a part of uh whatever the 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 instruction is from the ship or are you able to give specific orders for what a drone does one thing we didn't touch on in this particular call with chip that we have heard mentioned in the past and I don't know if this is going to be a part of gameplay, but it was mentioned that there would be potential threats, uh, PVE threats, uh, mm -hmm. to your mining claims. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you could actually have things that roll up mm -hmm. on you. So is that a way that you defend yourself from such things? Yeah. Imagine if they had those in Avatar, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> no, it makes sense to me. And, and if they're going for true realism and eventually a, a terrestrial gameplay loop. It seems to me that you would have stuff that could attack your base. You're on you're on alien worlds. There has to be aliens that not every planet is going to be without species. So I imagine, uh, you know, and, and maybe you pick the world that's light on species and it doesn't hurt you, but maybe you pick the wrong damn world and you get attacked every single day. You know, I think there, there would be some cool variability in there to put that in there. All right. <clears throat> Fancy, so, you got some other stuff? Yeah, there's, there was also a roadmap report this week. Uh, it's just a continuation of last week, but an update pretty much. And uh, ship had terminals. Look, dev first draft complete in engine using placeholder art. And a hall of leadership statues built out. Those are the things I found most interesting about it, really. Uh, I was wondering what like a hall of leadership could be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, the statues, uh, to me, seemed something that piqued my curiosity i'm really and it looks like you can see it up in the top left there right mm -hmm. yeah. yeah just the bottom half oh well so, yeah people can see it <laughs> being that yeah. this is the showroom maybe that is an opportunity for when you to be specific about picking a race you get to go and learn about each of them see their size mm -hmm. see them up close and personal the same way you're doing with a ship that makes sense i like that idea yeah 
and uh, just take a look back at all the other views we've seen from the showroom over the last couple of weeks. Yeah, I find it amazing that people's introduction to this game will not just be it's on Solana's beta network, and you know, it, uh, well, like they're going to be able to come in here onto the showroom and just use their imagination and follow along with the development of the game uh, via foundation or just via or through guilds and it's just going to be a way better uh, it's going to be much more sticky of a game where people the retention rate of people are going to are going to be much better for sure yeah and they've been showing some pretty interesting um work in progress stuff in the foundation room the stuff that we can't share yeah. there's some there's definitely some cool stuff coming um i think uh, we got exposure to a, a ship that's coming that um, just looks out of this world. It, it's almost impossible to tell what it was. So, so stay tuned in to, to, to Rome to figure that out. <laughs> Fancy, sure that's a like good to video to show for the picture. <laughs> I don't know if that was intentional or not. <laughs> just rounding off all the things we've seen and uh, starting to stack yeah. up. Got, got a lot of perspectives. Yeah, I, I was yeah. curious personally to know what games we weren't get to get, we weren't able to get to that question about what games in the NFT gaming space does uh, Chipto uh, uh, which ones are he, are he follow is he following is he involved in any other, any other games and what takeaways uh, or lessons is he learning from other games in the crypto space I think that would have been a great question maybe next time we'll ask mm -hmm. so uh, I have a question for for you guys in that regard because. I know that we develop some game bias based on the ones that we choose to focus on, the ones that appeal to us most, but is there really anything across the landscape in all of metaverse gaming, you know, game five blockchain games that you think is developing equally a, a foundation for the metaverse, the way that star Atlas is, what is there a close second? Is there anything that really is laying the foundation like that? You know, I've, you know was... I've seen a bunch of different projects out there, and I don't think there's any that are very clear in their ultimate goal, like Wagner has been. There are mm -hmm. some space games, but they don't advertise them as a metaverse that has a broad application other than its game, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I haven't seen anything short of maybe some of the Decentraland or Sandbox stuff that is, well, frankly, I, I don't like any of the things that I've seen in there yet. It's too blocky for me, but it doesn't, that that to me seems more like a place where people go to socialize where star atlas seems to be building as a place where people go to get work done um and maybe a, a more corporate aspect to it in the long run mm -hmm. yeah that's a good question jesse i was having this conversation with my brother like two days ago and you know because you know they you know we're talking about what projects i like or whatever and star atlas i think is a just moving forward at a, at a rate and with a strategy that is at a level that's much higher than you're seeing with other projects. I mean, I could go and talk about like certain Cardano projects and things like that, that are actually trying to build solid metaverses where they're actually mm -hmm. trying to uh, interact with the real world and things like that, that are going way beyond what the central land and whatnot are doing. But going back to what I told Shipto earlier, um, I hear economists mentioned a lot more when we're looking at Star Atlas. And you don't hear that with most of these projects out here. And yeah. you look at all these games that we've previously been invested into, some we've made money on, some we've lost. And the, the fact is, is that nobody's ever done any of this before. And so if you don't have actual economists working on your project there with you every step of the way, I mean, the, the chances of, of failure are rather high if you're not taking that seriously. Not just the chances of failure, but the chances of building yourself into a corner where you identify something later and can't fix it. 100%. So that's why the foundation is so important. That's the thing that I love about the fact that we're being exposed loop by loop, because we're really mm -hmm. seeing the game be built. Um, and, you know, we're going to be in a year, we're going to be able to look back and say that that ties all the way back to last, you know, February right. when, when this launched and, and, it's such a unique perspective that we're being uh, exposed to on game development. Well, that's one more key that I didn't get to mention with Chipto, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, because he, he's very transparent and the Starless team has been very transparent. And that level of transparency mm -hmm. is something that I don't think is equal across the, the current metaverse is being built either. 
the, 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 the focus on economists and the focus on being as transparent as possible, even to the point where it's a little uncomfortable for them sometimes because they'll have an update one week that doesn't really match the, the update they had the previous week. But we all respect that because we respect the transparency, you know? Uh, th that was one of the first things that attracted me to the project was interviews with um, Michael Wagner and, and how transparent he was being. And I think that set the tone to demonstrate that they understand the necessity of transparency and community involvement for the scale of this project. If you're a project that literally wants to keep tight wraps around it, you can say it's for the game lore and you're trying to save it for the fun. But for most part, that's a bit of an excuse and most people read through that. But if you're not, for what the scale of what they're trying to build, if you don't get community involvement, which requires transparency and trust, then there's some, to me, it leads towards there being some other reason why you're not sharing that information. And so I like the fact that they saw it was important to be transparent and open and communicate with the way they have with their town halls and, and the way that they communicate with us to say, hey, here's what we're doing. It's kind so, of funny because oh, one let's... second, real okay. fancy, real quick. The, the funny thing about that transparency is it's I think it starts to wear thin on Wagner sometimes because you'll see him say things like, I've said this a hundred times. I say this every town hall. Like you can tell he's getting annoyed at the, the regular questions and I just kind of chuckle. But I mean, that's a part of being transparent. You're going to end up repeating things over and over and over again. Sorry, Fancy. Yeah, I just wanted to quickly answer this question about uh, noble cloaks and noble singers because I have all the assets loaded up for this show. Mm -hmm. So, I'm not sure if they give any access to voting rights or rooms, but uh, they look cool. <laughs> I think they'll. Yeah. I the think human they'll actually looks lost. pretty cool. Speaking yeah. as an Oni, uh, the human actually looks pretty cool in that picture. You know, I, I I hate to say this, but that looks like the outfit that uh, that leader of the World Economic Forum got busted in on one of their videos. <laughs> Klaus Klaus Schwab or whatever his name is. Uh, <laughs> secret Society. Yeah, but I, I can't imagine it gives you. Maybe it gives you access, but to me, it seems like clothing would be buff buff related. Yeah, it's, well, it seems like they're wearing it in this poster, so mm -hmm. that could just be like a historical clout. Like really. the Armstrong patch, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Any, Going any back to what things? you were saying about the, the same questions being asked, uh, shout out to the community. We're, we're reaching that point ourselves where people are asking questions that we've covered, you know, on previous podcasts multiple times or that a guest covered earlier, you know, that he was talking about in the beginning and they might've just tuned in. And so they're asking a question that the guy already talked about. And so, you know, we're having to deal with that as well. And, and, you know, I think the community understands that. Yeah. And we get the luxury of just saying, Hey, these are our thoughts. He has to speak to the brand of the game and things like that. Mm -hmm. too. It's a lot of pressure. Some of the things that I wish we would have gotten to with chip though, is what, what the star Atlas looks like, right? What, what game does he envision it looking like? There's a number of different versions of a star mm -hmm. map um, and how you navigate it. Eves is pretty um, pretty available if you get on YouTube. Elite Dangerous is pretty uh, available if you get on YouTube. I yeah. probably need to pay more attention to Stellaris now because they keep bringing up that game. And It's a good game. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, the thing that uh, I was struggling not to ask so that we didn't get derailed because it's a it could be a whole other show. And mm -hmm. that is, as we were talking about planets and land and and things like that, like we theory crafted quite a bit on this in the past. We know that there could be up to 64 different land plots mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. on a planet. But is that like a large planet or going to be other small planets where there's only 30 or, or mm -hmm. 15 or whatever? And how many planets like how big is a faction? How do the factions overlap? with deep space how when you if you have three factions but you also have three zones how does that work you know so yeah mm -hmm. understanding what that map might look like and how big it is that's just this big open-ended question for me well and he did reaffirm dyson sphere for a planetary system so that to me tells us that if you want to be a guild who's who's going to build a dyson sphere for the benefit of your faction or your guild you should probably have a controlling state in a planetary system that's that's what it seems like. Um, but we've also talked in the past about how Dyson Spheres might be a faction-related um, tool. Um, but it, I don't know. What do you guys think? 
I mean, personally, I would like for us to, you know, be able to to do our own thing with Dyson Spheres, but I understand that how powerful that could be. And yeah. so you you come against this 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 issue of um do you want the power to be more available to more people and so thereby the power becomes reduced or do you want it to be a huge thing like we were talking about with Chipto as far as the titan ship like maybe it's a faction thing as opposed to a guild thing you know mm -hmm. um these are all good ideas and you know it's you gotta you gotta balance a game you know in a careful way especially when you, you have all these finances in there so it's it's something that I'm glad they're engaging with us about and not just, you know, dropping yeah. stuff on us. Well, as we go ahead, go ahead Jesse, I was going to say, as we talked about, you know, uh, the impact of a Titan within the whole gameplay and we have the factions and we have, we're now we're talking about Dyson spheres and we're talking about all these different things that kind of feel like they really should be more end game or things that you're working towards rather than being introduced right away. I could see a phase in the very beginning, like right now we're going to be seeding the economy with, with, um, with cream. We're going to, as you start to initiate some of the, the loops around the small, extra small ships for blueprints, and you're starting to do some crafting for the four R's that we need that we consume for our ship missions. This is beginning to seed the economy. Then from there, mm -hmm. I could see it where for the first year or so, even you're so wrapped up in establishing your own territorial dominance within your faction mm -hmm. that you don't need these end game things. And I don't mm -hmm. think we want to go there that quick. That should be something that develops naturally over time. There's so much gameplay to be had within the, the regions and the, within the faction and then trying to get resources and smuggling them from other factions and things like that, that, to jump so far out to these big dominant game factors, I think that kind of takes away from what we could make happen early game. Yeah, that's yeah. a good previous point, Jesse, that's, that's a I good think, point, Jessica. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I think with pre previous games, you know, Ray brought up a good point with Eve. Uh, you know, the 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 ship that was like the ship that was uh, everybody wanted became commonplace. And the unfortunate thing is, every game now is going to say, "Well, where's our version of this?" And they're going to want it sooner than later, um, so I think I think the cycle is going to be faster than we probably want from a, a longevity perspective. Sorry, guys. It's all you know. It's all good about all the time. But uh, back to what you were saying, Jesse. You know, kind of going counter to what you're saying, Banjo. The the game's not even seated. The economy's not seated yet, like he was saying. So how do you balance a Titan or a Dyson Sphere when you don't know what ore is? And you don't know what what steel is versus diamonds versus gold is yet. You know, how do you how do you know the you know they they have you know, the economy is being built still. Yeah, so you can't go to these huge. You can't build the Empire State Building. You never built a wood house before, and you don't even know what that costs. You know, um, how do you sell the Empire State Building before anybody's ever built a wooden house? You know, it's just a it's kind of one of those things that I, I feel like it needs to go a little slower. Yeah, for sure. They're going for a, a modular approach. You know, I showed this earlier and uh, what's in green is done, yellow is ongoing, orange is soon, red is when. And uh, <laughs> you can find, you can figure out where everything will fit into this, like uh, all the things that are released right now. Like I don't expect badges or uh, posters to become available, at least until the Star Atlas 3D browser. There's a lot of things that are outside of the scope of their current roadmap, but there is a lot of a lot in here at the moment. And when you like read through it, one thing I uh, thought about like properly for the first time was uh, blow uh, score tier one ship missions, leveling up uh, role licenses for account bound perks. And uh, that's going to be really interesting with all the different types of roles there are in this game, like all the different types of things you can do and how your early choices might affect mm -hmm. what you're going to do later. I think that um, with regards to like that Titan, I think that the in a big resource coming into the game early, that Ron, I think it was Ronald from the comments, I think that's honestly the best compromise. Uh, it, sir, it, it does two things, because the thing that I still don't have an answer for is what does it serve for Star Atlas? My immediate assumption is that it serves the need to raise some additional funds. So beyond that, what does it serve 
for the gameplay mechanics and for the economy as a whole. I don't know that one. So mm -hmm. one of the things that by selling the blueprint, which means you now have the right to build, it, it addresses that Star Atlas need, if that's what if the capital part is a need, but it also slows the process of that being built and it becomes this thing that now becomes a part of the gameplay process. Mm -hmm. I love that idea, if that's something they would consider. Mm -hmm. I thought it was a great idea too when I you know when we had that on the screen because also what that also allows is it allows you to understand what the like they can have the blueprint out and it can cost so much of x y z but you don't have to know what all those little things cost yet you yeah. know and that changes things as well what do you guys think is going to be locked behind resources so it seems to me that there's going to be a blueprint that needs diamond right mm -hmm. So is that how we we delay those mega structures is it needs resources that are just not going to be gotten in the first year or two? An obtainium? Yeah, un <laughs> there we go, an obtainium. <laughs> I mean, right. diamond, obviously, everyone wants to find the diamond planet. There has to be a use for that resource for everyone to want it so badly, right? I, I would think you could use uh, a, a scarce resource as well as a skill like you have to be so adept it requires you know whatever name you want to give in place of the word engineer you have to have achieved this level of skill to be able to even manufacture this component that needs this scarce resource so i think there's a number of levers you could pull to slow down that development process yeah i agree i agree i think a lot of the things we're discussing will happen um I, it's not like we're the only people talking about this. I'm sure I, I would love to be a fly on the wall on their their dev roundtables and really talk about what this stuff, um, you know, the reality of the timelines that they're thinking. Yeah. <clears throat> so uh, Jesse, do you want to bring us on to uh, what we have for Metaverse news? Yeah, sure. Are we ready to transition for that? You bet. Let me pull that up here. So yeah, essentially all I did today uh, uh, before the show was. Just uh, grab a couple of screenshots on the things that um, kind of stood out, you know, that are relevant to the space as a whole. Um, and let me add, pull that up on the screen there. Uh, and this was one that was obviously, a, you know, a, a big one because it's, uh, you know, meta, which is what triggered a lot of leaps in value that people uh, placed on on, on uh, projects within the metaverse, but of course, they uh, based on their quarterly earnings, uh, they dropped by eight percent, which then triggered a twenty-two percent drop uh, in their shares, which was insane. And then somewhere along this article, which was in the New York Times, it talked about them having spent ten billion dollars in the past year, which is more than what they even acquired uh, uh, their um, their VR. Uh, Oculus for yeah. yeah, so yeah, it's but there's 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 so much more to this. And as I was going through the metaverse news, and love to hear you guys' thoughts on this. There's an interesting thing that's happening right now because metaverse has become such a buzzword. Everyone and their cousin is trying to figure out how to incorporate their news and their stories into what's happening and impacting the metaverse, whether it really does or not. This one was a catalyst for sure. But the big thing that, in my opinion, being that Facebook was kind of like my past life, I spent a lot of time and energy uh, with clients uh, working with Facebook ads and that sort of thing. They just peaked out. There's, they were in such a rapid growth stage of people joining their network where they literally had almost a, you know, uh, 25 to almost 30% of the entire planet using their platform. There's not more people to continue that upward trend. So at some point they were going to level off. And that's part of what we're experiencing now, which is also why Zuckerberg's like, hey, man, we got to pivot. <laughs> and you know what's ironic, too, is that none of these big corporations or CEOs that direct their big companies in, into the metaverse are the ones that are necessarily going to build it the way that we, it already has been built to a certain extent. They, yeah. they, they don't know, like, it's already here. It's already here, and they're just now joining in to an already created metaverse uh, that they have to acclimate to. It's not them at the, at the head of the ship going to now, uh, you know, take, take over in any way. It's because it's how, how does one person or a group of people who weren't ever involved in the metaverse knowing uh it, no it, it's like a, it's like your elderly boomer parents uh telling you about cell phones and you're just gonna be like okay well they, they're already it's already invented 
you just need to learn about it now. And then once you get acclimated to what's already here, then you'll, you'll step down from that high horse of like, oh, I didn't know what I was talking about. I looked like a fool. And although I have all the money to buy all the phones, um, you know, uh, you I feel puts people in their place. <laughs> I feel I feel actually more like we're, we're in a in a battle or a new war that a lot of people don't understand is happening yet. I think that the metaverse is being built and there's all these actors trying to get their piece of it and, and gain their own position. Everybody's fighting for positioning right now. And I think that, you know, where the, the masses of us tend to focus our energy, our, our, our attention and our, our monetary value is going to determine where things kind of go as far as who's going to be in more control. And I think Facebook with the meta changes, they're trying to grab a, a, a piece of the metaverse. I'm curious, uh, Jess, do you have any knowledge on where this 10 billion was spent? Like, was it spent on VR or was it spent on acquiring games or was it spent on it was the like, trying to build something out? A good question. And I was trying to search for that myself in the article. And it's, it's basically on this, and I can't say it was all 10 billion of that, but a big portion of the, the focus and influence was in hiring and placing people on projects that are going to be around building out the, the stuff that he's demonstrated. I don't know if you followed the meta channel on YouTube, which is interesting. <laughs> no, I they have a YouTube yeah. channel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it doesn't specify exactly where, because that is a lot of money. So, so pick some shovels to, yeah. to kind of get it started, but basically exactly. where they're spending the money right now. So, yep. you know, that, that kind of goes back to what I'm saying, because, you know, all the other competing metaverses, whether it's Star Atlas, Axie Infinity, whatever, nobody's nobody has a perfect home yet. Even, even like the Central Land, and, and Sandbox, which to me seem to be the more successful ones right now, they, they don't really have a whole lot going on, like Banjo mentioned earlier. So, you know, I think everybody's kind of fighting for a position. And hopefully I want to see a place where you're able to move through all these metaverses freely and they're all yeah. decentralized in power to the point where you have reasons to go and visit different metaverses. You're not trapped into the IOI situation we've talked about before. Yeah. Well, you know, PG brings up a good point. They... Libra was a fail. That was their cryptocurrency initiative. Uh, and they just sold their Libra IP to another company, an investment company, I believe. So, you know, you I, know what? It wasn't a fail, though, as a result of it just not working. They got pushback mm -hmm, from, mm -hmm. from they got crushed. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and rightfully so. I mean, I think a company, well, uh, this is maybe a personal opinion here, but companies like Facebook, companies like Google, um, they already collect tons of data on us and now they're going to collect our purchase, our real purchasing habits if we're <laughs> using their coins. Yeah. Um, that's one of my concerns about the metaverse too, is, is tying these, our actions to our behaviors in a metaverse. How is that really going to show up and who's going to be selling that data to other people? And, and what I saw with, with Libra was them doing something that we all kind of know instinctively is a no, no, which is, they were kind of positioning themselves to compete with the U.S. dollar. And this is the thing that I, I go back to all the time when I talk about decentralization in these gaming platforms that we want to get into is at some point you're going to be competing with countries. If you're a metaverse where people are going and, and living and earning and bringing money back to the real world, you're going to be competing with other countries. And so if you're not decentralized to a certain point, what is your defense going to be when they come down on you just like they did on Libra. We saw them get crushed fairly quickly. They were in uh, hearings and then all of a sudden all the companies that were on board just quietly stepped back. You know, so we know that those were, you know, phone calls and emails getting sent and they went on ahead and made the right move, right? So what's to say that's not going to happen with these metaverse projects once they start really taking hold? Like Axie Infinity kind of took hold of the Philippines, but that was the Philippines. That wasn't the USA. Yeah. Yeah, interesting yeah, I, for sure. I, I think the equivalent of the fintech companies are kind of already here. You know, actually being one of them, Star Atlas, and, and sp specific to their genre of game, uh, because they're all kind of coming at the, the, at the place uh, differently when it comes to genre, like space for Star Atlas and so on. But um, it, it, would be, it, it would be like us not talking about Facebook or Microsoft and only talking about games or companies that are mid, like a... Uh, you know, not large cap, but mid cap. You know, if we only focus on mid cap, then where's the ship going? If these guys 
Meta, like Microsoft, Blizzard, and so on, are the ones making these moves that are directing the most of the population's attention, right? So if they have the most attention on them, it's only right that we do this, the equivalent in the space and learn from them or from their failures, from their, success, yeah. from the, their successes and failures. Uh, but yeah. I want to show you guys something here real quick that I want to stop. I want to share a different screen. And this is a, just an observation that I've been making recently um, about uh, which one is this one here? There we go. About what's kind of happening in this space as it relates to the metaverse. And what I'm on right now is I'm looking at CoinGecko and I'm looking at like this is the top market capitalization for what's happening in crypto. And so by category. You've got smart contracts platform right at the top. And then you have ecosystem, ecosystem after ecosystem, stable coin, all ecosystems. These are this is the the roadway. This is the infrastructure being built. And then upon what do you build it on? And even with the current crypto storm going on, if we like go to see what's happened within the seven day stretch, look what's up there. The biggest growth is in fan tokens, music, play to earn. GameFi, Metaverse, NFTs. So this is the stuff that's starting to sprout up that's being built on top of those infrastructures. This is the Metaverse. This is what's being built on those roadways that are being built with all those ecosystems. And so you see companies like Meta wanting to figure out how do we get involved in this? Because if we don't, we're missing out because this is obviously a rocket ship that's going somewhere. See some some big companies like Adidas and Pepsi and and you know they they've dabbled within the top three or four five six here you know Ethereum's main net like they they've they've made NFTs they've sold NFTs so they're dipping their toes in which warms up a couple of people who might have just entered the NFT space like oh this isn't just a scam because look uh, Budweiser is here oh Pepsi wow they wouldn't be here if if it wasn't legitimate oh I'm gonna secure my my, my, my place here in the NFT space by purchasing one of their NFTs. Okay, well, that's fine. But sure enough, it doesn't end there. And then the rabbit hole just goes deeper and deeper. And then once you branch out, you just see the, the distinct differences of a centralized type of um, system with these legacy companies coming in versus what's already been here for the last you know, decade or you know, less than that. But it, it's moving fast. And, and this is where everything is being built on. You know, like these, the, as the chart just shows, this is the networks. Not everyone will last. Just like in 2017, there was a lot of a lot of tokens that just went went bust. The, I, the ICO, the IDO craze, uh, craze of the time. We've passed that, you know. And now anyone who does an IDO, it's just like, okay, buddy, you just want money, you know. So so outliers are going to be noticed, uh, especially from those who've been around the longest. But some people, it's just just a learning curve, and a lot of understanding is going to be needed to to not get screwed over, and then and then feel like it's not a space for you but it will be hey jesse you can you can you bring that back up that chart you just had oh you bet one second here yeah. so what what i found interesting about that chart is that if you look at that for the seven day the the, the, the top gainers we're actually looking at the pieces the building blocks of the metaverse so you got yeah, fan token right that's meme cult so that's culture that's yep. social culture right there that's what these meme token things are and then you got music obviously that's culture play to earn which is gaming game fi gaming metaverse also the metaverse non-fungible tokens nfts which is culture also gaming mm -hmm. so you're seeing Sports. you know you, you got to go down quite a ways up. before you start seeing like the old DeFi stuff that we were that we were yeah. used to seeing in the crypto market you know right, right now down. the meta <laughs> yeah the metaverse is is taking off and it's it's really interesting, really dangerous, but really interesting. And and I'm I'm happy to be here, able to just watch this thing grow because there's so much opportunity. It's, it blows my mind. Well, and speaking that, of well, speak real quick. Speaking of uh, uh, fiction becoming reality, there was another story that's not metaverse related that came out. Um, but if you if you tie three stories together, it, it's kind of scary. So you've got metaverses. You know what everyone wants to go into they want to go and check out of life and check into the metaverse then you've got you know international global bodies saying you'll want for nothing you'll own nothing and then you've got china this is the story that i'm talking about who just announced that they have developed a way to um um in, uh, create human life in a vat um with babies so it's kind of like the matrix coming coming true right are they NFTs? Wow. Can you buy them? <laughs> <laughs> I want to flip them babies. 
<laughs> yeah, it was was as was pointed out here is sandbox, man. Sandbox winning. I mean, it's it's interesting. We see the the two big uh blips even on the metaverse news from a uh, meta news, Facebook Meta from a couple months ago. Those were the two that got big boosts out of that. I think that they are the most accessible to mainstream as to if someone says, well, what is the metaverse? The, probably the two that you can identify and speak to the easiest as projects are probably Sandbox and Decentraland, which is why they are really getting a lift right now across all these spaces, play to earn, GameFi. Uh, They're the metaverse. easiest to understand. Yeah. What's that, and, what's that blue yeah. uh, diamond there? Is that Axie or? It's AXS, yeah. yeah, it's Axie. So, so there you go right there because Axie was the first actual metaverse economy yeah you know i mean they've, they've been struggling obviously but it's it's nobody's ever done it before they were the first to do it in for any period successfully you know so it, it makes sense why they're up there as well yeah. yeah it's amazing like if you go at least below the surface level of any one layer one that's out there you're gonna find those diamonds in the rough or that those axs axi infinity type projects that are now the the, the most total lock value on that layer um, for, for what it's worth. So, you know, you got the DeFi kingdoms on Harmony, right? And then you have uh, on Avalanche, you know, I haven't gone too deep with knowing which one is there, but if they're, these are more like game type of, um, of, of uh, these are more games, NFT games on these networks because they, they, each one has a DEX, each one has a, so the more you get, a, you get situated with how, what every layer one needs to survive and to stay around, then you'll have a, a better, well-versed, you know, understanding of, of um, what you should do, and then what to do after an uh, an Axie Infinity popped up on any layer one, and then what's going to follow? Copycats. You know, there's going to be multiple projects that are going to copycat what was the most successful, and then you could probably front run those opportunities, but not bet the whole farm because they might not do it as well, or maybe they would. But that's it. All takes time and effort to to learn and to. And then you go d deeper into the dev teams and the white papers, and it's like a whole uh, rabbit hole of information to get into to feel confident enough to have your money in there long term. Well, it's getting harder line. and harder to do that, right? I mean, if you sure. go on Twitter and do hashtag metaverse, everyone's selling the next greatest project. Right. You know, everyone's yeah. got yeah. It's 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 all a big bunch of rug pulls on there now, and you, it's hard to weed out yeah. the good stuff through the bad stuff. Well, and especially but, because think to make something newsworthy, it's the objective of a marketing team for every company to say, okay, this is an active buzzword. What can we do to make a connection with that? Whether it's relevant or not, and that just muddies the water to be able to sift through things that are actually relevant. I mean, let's be honest, Jesse. We were the er we were we were early adopters on that because when we rebranded our name, what did we do? We we yeah. we 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 stuck it. We took it before Facebook did. Metaverse sure did. nomads. Yeah. Uh, I really like what you were saying, Ray, as far as different networks and copycatting, because that's something that I've been paying a lot of attention to lately. Is the different layer ones, right? So you got Solana. Like we were just looking at that chart from Jesse. A lot of that stuff was on Ethereum based or side chains of Ethereum. We haven't really seen the huge ethereum level explosions on solana and cardano but they're booming right now so you know cardano there's a lot of cardano people i know people on cardano who didn't even get into nfts until cardano had them you know and then you got block stack which is uh you know stacks token and they they have they're on you know bitcoin so a lot of bitcoin maximalists are, are they like that and that's where the city coins are coming from right so you have these different layer ones you have these different and they're all kind of competing and they're all kind of copying each other right now and the question is are they all going to continue to grow together or are some of them going to fall off but there's amazing opportunities in looking at these different these different layer ones and kind of diversifying into them as well and not being solely on the eth chains yeah, yeah. exactly and then for for to respect each project developing on whatever layer they are developing on, you know, each one might be doing something different than the last quote unquote Axie Infinity in their own right, right? They're, they're like for CyberKongs, they're on the EVM, so they're on Ethereum, but they just came out with lock registry, multi lock registry, which is a spin on what usually is staking, where you lock up and then you can't do anything else with that NFT because it's fixed in that one contract to earn a, a reward you know, a staking reward, but they just created something that hasn't been seen on any layer. And it's not, it's not that uh, you can do this now with any uh, uh, Ethereum NFT, right on, on the Ethereum network, but 
uh, just a brief description here. It says a new multi-lock registry was designed and implemented alongside the Jungle Adventure contract because the game is coming out for the for for CyberCongs VXs and babies, and it's uh, staking is a thing of the past. We, now we lock. So the purpose of the multi-lock registry is to offer the benefits of staking without uh, uh, without the need to send your of uh, your valuable assets to a smart contract that could eventually be compromised or cause a huge loss. The multi-lock registry allows CyberCong VX to be locked in the holder's own wallet by inhibiting uh, the token to be transferred when adding the CyberCong VX to a to a crew, which is max five to send on an adventure it goes uh it gets locked in the registry and cannot be transferred out of the wallet until unlocked by the owner so the locked so the unlocked uh, so to unlock a cyber kong's vx uh is simply it simply needs to remove uh, from the crew uh which will then allow the normal transfer as usual this will make uh, you lose uh so it's an item in the game you, you wouldn't be able to lose that item in the game uh and then so more or less, this is a CyberCong's innovation, uh, new innovation that brings a huge advantage to staking, uh, because CyberCong's VX can be used simultaneously with our registries, whitelisted contracts, and games that need to check the token in your wallet, and any other utilizing this techno te this technology. So you would still earn your rewards having your your asset staked, your NFT staked, but then you could still do many other things, uh, as signing off contracts or validating um, your you own the NFT. So I could see Star Atlas implementing something like this, where you can still stake your ship and earn rewards. And if you needed to use it in space, you would still be earning rewards, but you wouldn't be at any risk. And it's like a multi-benefit for... Uh, but that's the thing. The devs on the team for, for, uh, for CyberKongs, um, they're, they're innovative, you know, and they're doing things that are different that have never they're been... Some of the before. best. Yeah, pretty much. And, you know, I will... Uh, Owl of Moisture. <laughs> That's his name. That yeah. guy's from uh, old school OG from the uh, Axie Infinity community. So, and then even with the subnets on Avalanche, right? That's a whole other uh, innovative thing that's happening on there, which you know I won't get into here. But you can just Google it. And Delphi Digital has a nice interview with uh, the um, the the CEO of Avalanche, and he goes into how it's going to be a, a more efficient model that people will come around to understanding and then probably implementing on their own layer one. Uh, so if you just stick, if, if you just stick to Solana, it's in beta, there's, there's traffic problems, you know, like what's the most innovative thing happening on Solana, certain games being built on it, but the network itself, like what is, what is it doing and what is it trying to achieve? That's a different than another network because in the long haul, the games might still be around because you can always put your game somewhere else. Uh, it might be a, a huge task, but the net, you know, is the network going to be around? There's networks that fell through the cracks and ended back in you know, 2017 that we don't see around today. So it's going to be an interesting journey years to come down the line. Yeah. So that was the news for Meta. Um, in addition to that, we've got um, a couple other news bits here. Uh, as I mentioned this on the show earlier, like last year, 2021, there was 501 million in uh, in metaverse real estate that had sold and it's expected to double this year. So it just kind of goes to show some of the emphasis that's being placed and money moving in. And not all of this, by the way, is just, you know, individuals. There's actually uh, auction houses. Uh, there was one within the past month that spent uh, a couple million on uh, some metaverse land. And you're starting to see this as an investment that uh, groups are looking at as well, rather than just individuals, of course. There's a, I got exposed um, through one of my Twitter accounts that there's a company right now that's building metaverse uh, real estate agents, right? And they, yeah. they develop them and they have this course. It's like 400 bucks. I'm, I'm half tempted to pull the trigger just to see what it is. But looking at the curriculum, it's a lot of bringing people up to speed, like re real estate agents, mm -hmm. um, terrestrial real estate agents up to speed on crypto and metaverse and NFTs. But I think the goal of this company is to to allow people to have a resource they can go to to do this work instead of having to figure it all out, which makes complete sense because there's going to be people who want to put money into this stuff but don't know where to start. And if you have a metaverse real estate agent um, that's credentialed in some fashion, you know, you, you might get a better chance of doing something right and making less mistakes. I might have to switch careers, Banjo. I'm going to need that uh, info <laughs> offline, my guy. I'll give it to you, man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, some other metaverse news here who's using the metaverse 
poker players now in Decentraland, uh, their daily user count is up to over 5,000 that are just in Decentraland at a casino. And that casino is, uh, has brought in seven and a half million in just the past uh, three months or so. So, you know, it's, we talked about this on the past show, on past shows about how human nature and the things that we do in the real world, all of these things that are aspects of being human are going to show up somewhere in the metaverse. But, uh, we're already seeing, uh, you know, the wagering and the gambling, uh, even within Decentraland, it seems. And I'll tell you what, so my, my PFP right now in Discord is actually um, something that I'm not going to promote or suggest anybody get a part of, but it is the Secret Society, and they are talking about building uh, casinos in the metaverse and, you know, getting celebrities to, to shout them out and things like that. Um, this is a space that's that's booming right now as far as gambling in the metaverse. My, my brother was, showed me a video one day of a guy who actually took a job working in a casino um, just being the guy to help the people, you know, figure out how to play the games in that casino or whatever. And he was, I think he was like working like four days a week for like six hours or something like that. Yeah. Interesting. Metaverse calls here. Uh, NFTs construct virtual economies to stay relevant in 2022. Come on. We all knew that already. But what I thought was interesting and funny about this one here is that buzzword utility. NFTs got to carry some utility with them now. <laughs> and that's what makes them forward looking. So, right. yeah, we're going to see a lot more of that. And I think that we blew through that phase real quick where, yeah. you know, you just have an NFT project because it's got cool art. It's like, no, nah, got to have some utility Ooh, now for mm -hmm. it to make any sense. <laughs> yeah, and all of this will take place because we demand it. You know, the, right. the Gala Games, you know, mm -hmm. it, it, that's the main issue with them. They don't have anything. There's no utility to anything you buy. And they come out, Bitbender says it, you don't deserve to own to get anything. You don't get shit for holding anything. That's literally what he said after you just buy it. So yeah. for what it's worth, maybe he would be bunched, in my opinion, bunched in with the rest of these people who are still on that learning curve. The, 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 the Microsofts, the... Uh, the Facebooks of the world, right? So they're still behind on what's actually been happening for a long while. Yeah. Someone actually had mentioned it a couple times in the comments, and we just didn't have any time to go into it on this show with Miranda's updates and all that sort of thing. But I, I can tell you from my own observations, there has been only two updates this year in the announcement section for Miranda. So nobody really knows where development is there um, behind, which again, which is why we've kind of d directed our attention elsewhere is that we saw the writing on the wall that it was going to be a long time before we saw anything tangible. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. When you ask someone, what's the utility of something? And they say, what are you talking about? All right, we'll be back when you know. <laughs> <laughs> and on, on the dark side i think myself and i think banjo as well have both mentioned this several times the the nft metaverse boom of our time right now reminds me of the ico boom of 2017 and how many of those projects are, are still around you know the, if you look at the top 10 coins there's i think i was just looking at it the other day it's like four of them or five of them that are still there you know what i mean so you know that's where we're at kind of right now in the current market in 2024 what's still going to be there i'll take it and i'll take it another level down bona fide and i think we're seeing the first digital beanie baby uh in many cases <laughs> with nfts yeah right. absolutely <laughs> uh one other thing here that um last slide that i've got and this is i think exciting news and that is coinbase uh listing solana based projects we haven't seen atlas hit the hit uh, coinbase yet but uh based on this news it's probably not too far behind. We've heard some whispers of it. Uh, they've already put uh, uh, these two that we see listed here uh, on there. But um, yeah, that just means that it couldn't be much further behind. And of course, once that happened, it's most likely to give a little bit of a lift to uh, uh, and, and accessibility to Atlas. So that's exciting. And then who knows what exchanges will pick it up from there. So these are all things that uh, help us grow in the right direction. Um, one thing that I didn't have as a piece of news, but I think it's important and it's to be wary that there is a piece of malware that's been circulating out there that targets about 40 wallets right now, uh, calls Mars Stealer. And it's pretty savvy stuff. Uh, and it, it, and it, and it's, you won't really even see it can show up and then be gone. It targets browsers. 
Um, and I don't even think it's uh, uh, operating system specific, but it's just something to be aware of that things like this are developing. So, you know, start putting measures in place to make sure your stuff is safe because it's specifically looking for particular domains, uh, particular exchanges, um, and it is targeting uh, key phrases and uh, passwords, and it is all about trying to uh, to access your crypto. So. Do you know the vector, Jesse? Is it is it um, is it something you open in email, or you go to a web page and it downloads a, a pixel, or do you know what what drives it? Yeah, good question. And I've been I didn't have too much time, which is why I don't even have a slide around it because I was trying to figure all that out so I could be a bit more informed. Uh, but it is, I would imagine, you would have to download something. It is very light, though, and being that it is targeting browsers and it does clean up behind itself, meaning like it will also exit once it gets what it needs. Hmm. That's unfortunate. Yeah. Why? Well, uh, anything else, Jesse, or fancy? That's it for news for me. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's been a good show. Very good. Uh, so, who wants to announce our guest for next week? Uh, well, we spoke about it a bit last week. Uh, it's going to be MMA Metaverse Mining Alliance, and we're going to yep. talk about how you structure a blockchain guild. Uh, yeah, I would go as far as to say that is, it is probably getting well known at this point that uh, Rome is not into alliances. We, we we just have a firm stance that there's so little known about what an alliance and Star Atlas could mean and what it could do for you. So it doesn't make any sense to have that. Uh, but MMA, who has flown pretty much under the radar for quite some time, uh, they're quite savvy in the uh, on-chain aspect of what it might mean to be a to to make a business of your guild. And so we've been exploring what that means with them. Uh, and so we want to have a conversation with uh, with them about that here on the show and expose uh, you, the listening audience, uh, conversations around like, well, what does that mean? And, and this is also, I've seen some news around this recently. Uh, Play to Earn is showing up. Actually, uh, Coin, uh, Coin Bureau. Coin Bureau mm -hmm. just literally had a, he just put out a video two days ago about the whole uh, uh, gaming guilds mm -hmm. and about mm -hmm. how if you got play to earn, that speaks to the individual. But now you're starting to see the growth of guilds that are showing up. Say, how do we make a business out of this? How do we actually make a business of a guild? So we're going to have that as a conversation next week with MMA. I think that's fantastic. And I think, um, if you're going to have assets that need to be deployed into a game, it makes sense that you have organizations that are basically a business that run your assets for you. So I'm excited to hear that conversation next week. Yeah, I'm, I'm uh, looking forward to this a lot. Sorry, man. I'm looking forward to the conversation a lot. These guys are approaching the space in a way that, like, I don't think no one else is. And, you know, we've agreed to have them on. So, um, you know, I think this is going to be pretty good, a pretty good conversation about uh, game economies overall with them and you know mma they're uh the guild about guilds and businesses you know like more centered mm -hmm. around that and um the and pro potential rewards for hedging uh medium-sized guilds you know so i mean that was the that was the reason for us all coming together in the beginning right it's like you're putting a bunch of money into this space you know how do you protect yourself how do you leverage yourself where well, you need to associate yourself with like-minded individuals so we all did that for ourselves and, and came together with fancy and, and did roam and you know you got other guilds out there doing similar things and you know shout out to the star Atlas community because a lot of the guilds that we see out there you know some are you know interesting and some are really doing some impactful things out there in the space so i think we're all probably open to having conversations with with other guilds in the future i think we've done maybe one in the past with a couple other guild leaders but um you know, I think it's interesting for us all to, to start talking about what it takes to, to be out here and, and how we can all interact together in a, in a way that's profitable for everybody. No, yeah. I agree 100 percent. Looking forward to the conversation. And with that said, uh, it's time to bid goodbye to the community. Uh, we'll see you next week. It's been a fantastic episode with Chipto uh, and the other stuff that we discussed. We're so happy that you're all here. Please like and subscribe. We'll be We've here got next a new week. outro. And we've Just got a new outro, out. so Stick please wait for, for our, outro, our outro. Um, and I, I, I think we all tend to be pretty pot proud of this one. So have a great week, everyone. Atlas Miner, you were born To push the block in search of ore Now it's time that you were gone 
so farewell Atlas Minor And farewell mud and pony too Who's the sector same to you? The pirate bastards ran him through So farewell Atlas Minor They promised you a diamond mine I'll be damned, it's hard to find I hope there's justice for their crimes And farewell, Atlas Minor And farewell, friend, don't take it hard Getting killed ain't all that bad I'll treat you well in the repair yard So farewell, Atlas Minor